everyone and welcome to the Justice Committee's 22nd meeting of 2017. No apologies have been received. Our first item of business is a decision on whether to take item three in private. This is consideration of um, the committee's approach to the scrutiny of the civil litigation expenses and group proceeding Scotland bill at stage one. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you for that. Item two is our fourth evidence session on domestic abuse uh, Scotland bill and I refer members to paper one which is a note by the clerk and paper two which is a private paper. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr Marcia Scott, Chief Executive of Scotland's Women's Aid and Heather Williams who is the Chair of SWA Board of Directors and formerly the Manager of Roshire Women's Aid. I also welcome Jiriyamba Bolu Botu who is from Shakti Women's Aid. Aid. And um, can I say I'm very grateful to, Scotland's, uh, to Scottish Women's Aid for providing written submissions. That's always very helpful for the committee. And with that, we now move through to questions from members. Anyone first? Mary, then John. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning. Um, I'm really pleased that you could all um, come this morning, and I do thank you for the, the evidence that you've submitted. I wanted to ask a specific um, question into um, the effect that this legislation will have on women from um, an ethnic um, background, because there is sometimes a little understanding of the religious and cultural um, differences that, that, that separate different, different women. And I know from meetings that um, in another committee role that I've had with Shakti, there are quite specific issues around arranged marriage, um, honour-based violence, um, and, and whole kind of family dynamic. Um, and perhaps if I could start with um, Shakti, how do you think this bill has the potential to um, impact on, on women from um, different cultural backgrounds? Um, first of all, I would like to thank the committee even to think about uh, recognising the coercive control. It's so important that, you know, I was just saying to Marsha, if you ask a woman to record um, the times that coercive control happened and the times that physical abuse took place, I'm absolutely sure you'll have a large number of coercive control happening, but yet we haven't recognized the coercive control. We always look for physical abuse and the bruises, and uh, th that's what I want to say. For the way I would look at it is, we need to look at, doesn't matter what culture or ethnicity a woman comes from, it's a gender-based violence. And I think the perpetrators are using the rules, the roles that we set for men and women. So what they're doing is they're taking the role that the society set for a woman, cook, clean, nurture, all these things, and then using those against her to assert their power. So first of all, we have to look at it in a gender-based violence. And doesn't matter which culture or religion or where the woman comes from, all of us have to follow the legislation in this country. We are living in this country. We are not living in our country, so we have to follow that. If you don't follow, then I look at it as a discrimination against BME women for not following the legislation. The first thing, for ethnic minority women, one of the things that happens in a coercive control is, I want to raise one, uh, two, three points. One is when the woman is controlled um, in a way that they, it's more of a black, I wouldn't say blackmail, it's more of saying, telling her that if you don't or if you do, I'm going to harm your family abroad. So that's something that you don't see in the mainstream because most of the women's family, paternal family seem to live in her country. So that fear is there. And another thing that the perpetrator normally uses is to kind of, um, what to say, create rumors against her character or the female siblings of hers. And that will bring shame to the family and that will become honor-based violence and sometimes they use that when you're talking about cultural thing that's what i want to raise so that's something that's cultural a thing but then again please don't look at it mm. in that way come back to gender-based mm. violence another point that happens within bme communities that 
you don't see so much in mainstream or not at all is dowry related abuse where there's constant demand from the perpetrator or from the family members for, to the woman to bring in more money or expensive gifts from her parents. And sometimes the parents themselves are quite poor. You know, they might have given some dowry at the beginning for the girl to get married and to have a better life. But later on, they don't have that kind of money. And here, uh, and that turns into physical abuse. Here, you, I haven't seen any um, uh, killings, but if you take like India and all, women are burnt because of this dowry related abuse. And sometimes they commit suicide, but I look at it as a murder rather than suicide because she's forced into taking that action. So, and another thing how this is going to benefit uh, ethnic minority women is, I don't know how many of you actually know about no recourse to public funds and how it applies to domestic abuse, immigration status, and the destitute domestic violence concession. So if a woman is fleeing domestic abuse, she can go under the destitute domestic abuse concession. But the problem now that we are facing is where there is coercive control, she has to evidence the abuse, domestic abuse, but where there is coercive control, there is not enough evidence that she actually can produce because she hasn't told anybody that what's happening to her. And when she did disclose the abuse that happened to her, to her closest um, relations, which could be mum or sisters, then it's seen as I'm going back to the role of a woman, how we society expect a woman to cook, clean, do this and all. So for, for those reasons, her fears are kind of dismissed. It's kind of said, that's your role. You know, your husband is asking you to just cook for him. And we had cases where the husband wanted women to stay size 10 all the time. But the way he says it to her, uh, it's about your health, I want you to look pretty, I want you to wear this pretty clothes that I bring for you. The thing is, the day that, at the beginning, women enjoy this because they don't know what's happening. But the day that either she's not feeling well or something, and the day that she says no is when the physical abuse takes, this takes back to my coercive control, how many times it happens, and then the physical abuse. And, but if you tell your mom, he, he always buys stuff for me and he wants me to dress up, would mom look at it as an abuse? No, she'll just say, he loves you, you know? So anyway, that, that's part of it. So it's becoming difficult to evidence coercive uh, control and therefore, the women are now failing to get the secure immigration status, which actually is putting them at real, real um, risk because once they go on to destitute domestic abuse concession route, they're losing their current um, immigration status, which could be spouse visa. So they then rightfully are supposed to be deported. They then are supposed to leave. So can you see, it's like a carrot. You just say that there is this, thing you can take, but then if it fails, you're in more trouble than before. Um. Just, just before I come to um, Dr. Scott, do, do you think then that there should be a way of reflecting in the bill um, the use of um, religious and cultural um, abuse almost as an aggravator to, to domestic abuse? Do you think that would help? Sorry, I got distracted by my water, I think. Um, uh, do, I, do I think that... Let me just make sure I understand. Yeah. Do I think there should be something in the in the bill uh, itself? More explicit, uh, reflecting the, the, the cultural um, and, and religious abuse as an aggravator almost? Mm. I think um, there's a crossover here between thinking around hate crime mm. um, and how we uh, how we approach that and, um, and the, the very specific nature of domestic abuse. I think I would support what, um, what Jerry was saying, which is that um, we need to remember that 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 this is really about gender, um, and that that perpetrators use all kinds of things. Absolutely, um, they use culture uh, uh, and and you know sort of familial permission giving, <clears throat> cultural permission giving, um, and I think uh, 
I would be very interested in expanding our approach to hate crime that included gender and that allowed then some crossover around looking at how other protected characteristics are used to exacerbate existing abuse. Um, but I can't, uh, you know, until we have a, a, a sound framework for thinking about gender and hate crime, I think it's going to be difficult to do in the context of this bill. Okay. Ms. Williams, do you have anything to add? Um, I think, you know, the experience that we had in um, Russia was around particularly women from Eastern European um, countries. Mm. Um, and I think, as Giri says, the, the you know, specifics for, for women who have um, insecure immigration status, even though they, they come, you know, there's issues around there for, for women from, from Eastern Europe, um, around the right to, to be here, particular with the, um, what's happening around um, Brexit, but also just in terms of the right to um, accept, access benefits and things like that. Um, and that gets used against them in terms of, um, you know, if you leave, there's, you, you're not going to be able to um, stay here on your own. Um, and, and, and I think that's that gets used against women um, when they've got insecure immigration states, if they're not originally from the UK. Um, but I think the, the bill in terms of how, you know, um, it's set out in the... Um, the factors that it's asking you to look at probably covers that, certainly in terms of the consultation that we did with, with women that we were working with. Um, to the original consultation um, has, has expanded the, the behaviours and the tactics that abusers um, use. Um, so I, I think it's about trying to look at it as part of the, the, the tactics that abusers use in the whole, as opposed to um, seeing it as something that sits separately, because it is about the abuse and, the, and abusers will use whatever they, they can to, to maintain that control. Yeah, thank you. Can you say something? Mm -hmm. Please. Um, when I don't know what you meant by whether to include religious or cultural, we have to be very mindful when looking at it because you don't want the perpetrators to hide behind their cultural religious. It happened in the past where the judges have just said, oh, this is a cultural thing, that's fine. It's manslaughter, not murder. It happens. So we have to be very careful when we do think about including something into cultural or religious. Almost in the way that a perpetrator could use it as an excuse to say, well, that was reasonable behaviour. But this is my behavior. religion. It's reasonable behaviour. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's what you have to be mindful about yeah. that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. John, followed by Rona, Mary, and then Liam. Okay, thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel, and thank, thanks for your evidence. Uh, I particularly um, want to pick up on the written evidence from Scottish Women's Aid there and uh, the references to the human rights obligations placed in the Scottish Government. And, Particularly the comment the bill is not perfect. Um, now, I, I know that we'll, you know, uh, practical experience will shape understanding. Uh, we, we heard last week from the police that there already is an awareness. I, I don't know if you followed the evidence last week already, an awareness of controlling and behaviour, coercive behaviour. Um, it's important we pass good laws and practical laws. Do you, do you, do you see challenges in the, the, the policing of this in its broader sense? Please? Were it to pass, obviously? Um, I think the bigger challenge is trying to police in our current context. And uh, um, absolutely, uh, as we said in our response, this, this will chart new land, you know, new legislative territory in Scotland. Implementation of anything new is always a challenge. Um, but I think the biggest risk to us is, is not challenging the status quo. So, so women have told us for 40 years that the the impact, uh, the traumatic effect of psychological violence and coercive control is by far worse than any other abuse that they experience. Um, what, what kind of a risk averse you know, response would we have if we didn't try then to create legislation that actually reflects their experience? Will there be, I, th I actually think that the Crown Office and the police, and I did follow the, their um, evidence giving session, um, are, are already working to a, a, um, a challenge, the challenge of reflecting course of control in the way they train their officers, in the way they, they make uh, first response calls, in the way they review cases for prosecution. The question is whether we give them the tools in this new legislation that actually allows them to do their job better. And I don't want to sound pie in the sky. I don't think it will go terribly well right away. And I also think that um, because of the nature of how you implement policy, it will be years before we see ac the actual impact on policing. 
Um, and I think we have choices about whether we provide them with the resources that they need to do a better job or a worse job around this. But the last thing in the world I think, I think either police are saying or that we are saying is that we should shy away from doing the right thing because we think our police aren't capable of policing it. Can I just clarify them? When you say resources, what do you mean by that? Are you meaning knowledge and Thank the legislation? Thank you for that question. <laughs> um, I think our biggest concern about this bill, well, one of a number, is that um, we fought really hard for a coercive control bill for a long time, and uh, but we are very aware, and as a policy geek, I'm extremely aware that um, a, po a, piece of, a policy instrument is only as good as its implementation. And I think we have a history in Scotland and in lots of other legislatures of creating very good policy and seeing very little change in people's lives as a result of it because we haven't paid attention to the challenge and task of implementation. For us, the, the biggest um, worry, I suppose, around implementation is there's a massive resource gap in terms of training in Scotland as it is around uh, to implement Equally Safe. And this will be a big challenge for police, not just uh, in terms of the new law, but in terms of behavior change at the, at the coal face for police officers in terms of support and supervision within their structures, in terms of partnership working so that social workers, healthcare, all of those folks understand the challenge. And um, if we really want, I mean, this will, this will be transformative potentially, this legislation, but only if we actually pay attention to having competent judiciary, competent legal sy systems and, um, and making the rest of the system fit for purpose. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but I, I really would like to see us, and I would implore the Justice Committee's help um, uh, with making sure that when we put a bill through that there's a chance that it will actually transform the, the lives of women and children. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay, Rona followed by Murray. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask you about the defense of reasonable behavior, which, um, I know in your submission that you have some concerns about. Um, I wonder if you could just expand on your, your worries about that. Um, you, you state that you know, it could be open to manipulation by abusers. And maybe you could just expand a bit further. Absolutely. Um, I, I, think in, I think it's important for us to note that in the final um, uh, assessment, we're very happy with it, having the reasonableness test in there. Um, we are worried because one of the features of many domestic abuse perpetrators is that they seem rational and reasonable and righteous. And, and so um, in, in, if you were to look at a particular incident, for instance, the test of reasonableness would be very scary for us because often from the outside, a particular incident doesn't look um, like it's a part of a pattern of coercion. Um, but the... The context of this bill reassures us in the sense that what we have now is an opportunity and a demand actually that the criminal justice system look at the course of behavior um, and that they an, examine a particular incident in the context of that relationship. Um, and, and since we are confident that that the vast majority of professionals, officials, and indeed the public in Scotland don't think that it's reasonable to threaten your children, to threaten killing their pets, to um, you know, financially abuse, to do any of the things that we know are regular features of coercive control. We, we are content that as long as the, the nature of the abuse is seen in the context of the relationship, that the reasonable test will actually be all right. I think, um, again, it's about implementation. And I also think that um, uh, Heather and I were talking about this prior to this session, that you know, what, what we need to really pay close attention to is that the threshold for reasonableness, for distress, for all of the things that have been being discussed at such length with this committee needs to be the same across Scotland. And that means that in rural and remote areas in particular, um, the infrastructure that supports understanding 
um, an application of the law needs to be as robust as um, in the central belt where we have lots more resources. So, so were your concerns mainly that it would be open to interpretation in individual cases? I or? think the, the, the construct of the bill is, um, is sound. Again, the proof will be in the pudding in terms of the understanding of the judiciary and interpreting the bill. And I, I can't bang on about that, and I do bang on about it a lot in public, but about the importance uh, I, of any sheriff or judge hearing a domestic abuse case must have, even now, specialist training, and sadly, most of ours don't. I think in the context of this legislation, that's an even more critical need. Okay, thank you. Heather? Um, I mean, I think, you know, coming from a kind of rural area, one of the things that we've seen, particularly around the um, stalking offence that we currently have, um, is that what we often get is that, well, you know, if you, if you, if you, women all say, well, he was at the shop at the same time as me, or he was in the same place as, as me. Um, and what you often get is in terms of that reasonableness is, um, well, actually, why wouldn't he have been there? Because it's the only shop in the, in the area. Um, but when that's happening all the time, um, that this person's turning up, that's in, you know, in your environment, um, that becomes quite distressing. That can become really distressing. But in rural areas, we, you do hear that of, um, well, where else is he going to go? Or, you know, what else is going to, you know, why would that be a problem? You've both got to live in the same kind of small area. Um, so I think that would be, um, a, a, you know, a, a concern in terms of how we already see current legislation play out um, in relation to the, um, the issues that come with um, remote and rural areas. Um, but also I think it's about recognising that sometimes the, the tactics that um, can be used in, um, f with um, by abusers who are living in remote and rural areas through kind of isolation. So, um, you know, maybe they're the only one that drive and they go and get the, all the shopping because it makes sense because they drive and they're getting it on their way home from work. But actually what they're doing is they're controlling the food that comes into the house. They're controlling what that woman gets to eat. Um, they're actually um, controlling, um, you know, um, just the, the, the sustenance that she can get and also her ability to actually do those kind of tasks um, because he's maybe saying to, to you that, well, it makes sense for me to do it, I'm doing it on my way home from work. Um, but actually what he's saying to her is, well, you can't manage to do a shop. You know, there's, you're, you're, every time you go shopping, you spend far too much money um, and he checks the bin when he comes home to see actually what she's eating of the food that day um, or that the, the kids have, have, have eaten as well. So I think it's about recognising that, you know, in terms of some of the tactics that abusers use, um, remote and, and ruralness can give a, a, a make things look slightly more reasonable than it maybe would in, in other circumstances. And I think um, Marsha's right in terms of, um, just in terms of the, the structures and the infrastructure that there is in, 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 in rural Scotland, it's not the same as what we've got in, in, in the central belt. Um, and for this um, bill to be successful, for it to have that transformational change that we believe it can have, um, that has to come a long way. Um, proper training for the, justice, for, the, for the sheriffs and for the judges, um, for um, the, um, the Crown Office and for the police um, and for other professionals. At the moment, we have, there, there's too many people who still don't understand domestic abuse and, and, and the dynamics. What you've just said highlights that what Dr. Scott was saying about the need for specialist training. Yeah, thank you. Mary? Sorry, yes. When you, I'm sorry, I have to say because, yeah, I feel you need to know. <laughs> uh, one of the things um, when it comes to BME families, you need to consider the extended family members' involvement. And sometimes the women and men have the same families because in, in Islam, women and men marry their cousins. So your family is her family. And sometimes actually the coercive control is there, you know, when you have the contact issues with the children or something. But then if she, she is visiting her family, but that family is also his family, so he could be there, and that's arranged by the extended family members, and she doesn't know anything about that. She's just visiting her sister or her cousin, and he happens to be there, although he has um, orders not to approach her. But then how are you going to say he's doing wrong? Because he's not doing wrong. He'll just I didn't know you were coming here. I'm here. Mm -hmm. So just to know that kind of manipulation yeah. as well, please. Thank you. Sorry. That's helpful. Um, 
Mary Vendy. Thank you very much. Um, well, a couple of the issues of, that I was going to raise have already been touched on by Mary and by Rona as well, because I thought it was really important what you said. Uh, quite a few of the things that you've mentioned this morning, because um, we had we heard uh, privately from some victims of domestic abuse, and we'd had a uh, Shack Day representative at our group as well, and it was hearing some of those particular issues there. Um, I, I, one woman that we spoke to, I mean, she talked about the influence of her of her mother in that situation as well, and. <laughs> You know how that you know just encouraged to kind of put up with it in a way, and also the no recourse to public funds, and you know actually seeing the impact that that has on people. You know, in a situation where, like like you've mentioned, the immigration status is up in the air, and you know there they are entitled to nothing and have no, when, especially when they have children here as well. So I, I was really um, glad to hear that raised. Um, but there were a, a few other. Um, so Marcia, you mentioned earlier that you, about a few other concerns that you you'd had with the with the bill as it is, and I just really want to tease some more of that out, as well as ask a particular point that was raised in your evidence about the emergency barring orders. Um, I'm just wondering if you could expand a bit on that, and is this something that's used, uh, are there examples in other countries as well? I'd just be interested to hear other panel members' views on that. Thank you for that. I was just sitting here going, oh, I hope I get to talk about emergency <laughs> barring orders. Um, absolutely. While we think this is a very good bill, we think it could be improved a bit, um, uh, and uh, one of the, the clear issues, which also crosses over, John, with some of our human rights obligations for human rights instruments, is that um, at the moment, Scotland does not have sufficient legislative um, uh, interventions around helping women um, in, in the context of, of um, uh, crisis or around domestic abuse. And um, unlike most countries in West, in the Western world, I have to say, we do not have legislation that, that is effective in terms of emergency barring orders. So down south, for instance, and I do not suggest that we use their model because it's not very effective, but they have domestic violence protection orders which can be um, uh, uh, used by the police in, an, in a, a crisis situation. And um, in order to be compliant with the Istanbul Convention, but also in order to help women um, stay safe in their own homes um, and not have to move their children out of, out of their schools and not have to be the one who pays the price of domestic abuse um, uh, all the time. We need a, a, a legal mechanism that allows uh, um, women to stay at home and the perpetrator to be removed, and it's for a short period of time. There are many, many versions of this kind of legislation around Europe. We have a briefing paper that we're very happy to share with the committee if, um, if that would be helpful. But we, um, especially on the back of research that, that we did in Fife with um, women who'd been made homeless as a result of domestic abuse, it's very, very clear to us that uh, current practice um, in housing and homelessness um, uh, departments has been to essentially um, f uh, make women become homeless in order to access services. And an emergency barring order would be an enormous improvement to this bill. Um, and, and essentially, I think, is required in order for the bill to, to do what it says on the tin of our commitments to women's human rights not to be made homeless in order to access support. So the other thing that I would say um, in terms of the bill, and I think you will have seen some of this in the, in the consultation responses from our colleagues in the children's organizations also, we, we struggled really long and hard. And I, I just need to put down a, a, um, a marker to say that there has been, as, as Michael Matheson pointed out when we launched the bill, when the bill was launched, that um, there's been unprecedented engagement with the voluntary sector organizations on the development of this bill. We absolutely hated the first version, um, which was years ago. Um, and I think the extraordinary transformation of, of this into a bill we can support um, uh, shows a really good, th the way that policy should be made. Um, so anyway, one of the things that there's been lots of engagement about is the role of children. And the really critical principle, which isn't that difficult, it seems to me, for people to get, but which is not really reflected well in this bill, is that um, 
All, we have libraries of evidence that say that children who live in families where there is coercive control and domestic abuse experience coercive control and abuse. Um, uh, it doesn't matter whether they're in the room or in the house or in the country at the time of a particular incident. They're harmed by it. Some more than others, but the reality is that that, that is the very um, the very nature of domestic abuse, that children are used, but also children are controlled. Um, we wanted that reflected in the bill somehow, so that in particular, when we then saw the bill leave the criminal justice sphere and move into the civil justice sphere, that children being victimized by a perpetrator of domestic abuse did not get completely lost in the, the process then that looked at um, contact and, and visitation decisions made in the context of civil law. Um, so we were, we were hoping that we could have something in which absolutely children are victims of domestic abuse only when their parent is a victim of domestic abuse. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult way to construct it, but we really wanted this bill to reflect the fact that if there were children in the family, there were child victims. Um, the, I think it took us a while to get that principle across. I think the bill team actually did understand that at the end, but they struggled with finding a way to frame that in the bill. And we've had commitments from officials that they would try and take this up in other pieces of legislation um, and policy. But I, I would think that there is a way that we could, we could do this somehow and also make sure that children are seen all the way through in our responses when they're in a case as needing support and services, needing to be covered by um, non-harassment orders. That is so important in terms of women and children's safety, those kinds of issues. Um, so th those would, I think, would be the emergency barring order and, and um, some some way of acknowledging children's experiences of domestic abuse in a better way are the two big um, improvements I think could happen with this bill. Well, you very neatly just almost answered my se what my second question was going to be. I was just going to lead into the non-harassment orders as well and ask about some of the other evidence that we'd received, um, particularly from the likes of Children First who talked about have, you know, imposing non-harassment orders um, where, uh, where a child, and that that should involve uh, the child as well and to kind of tease out your thoughts on that as well. But I take it that's something that you would be supportive of. We are, actually it was our idea, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're happy, happy to support it. Um, I think it is really, really important that, um, that we understand that at the moment non-harassment orders do not work well for the vast, vast majority of cases in Scotland. And we, I know that, that the, one of the consultation responses was from an anonymous um, person who has been in touch with us and was was uh, citing some research that she did in her area that said out of 500 convictions of domestic abuse, 30, you know, there were 30 non-harassment orders. They are not working. They're really a problem for women and for the system itself. We think that if we put in an expectation that non-harassment orders would be issued in the context of domestic abuse convictions, um, that it would, uh, it would save money, it would save um, uh, trauma, and it would send a really clear message to perpetrators about what their expected behavior post-conviction is. Um, it's critical that they cover children because if they just cover the mother, there is a massive then um, tool for further abuse in the context of approaching children. So, and uh, you know, non-harassment orders that cover children also are also a feature in lots of different forms of legislation across Europe. So it's not like we would be, you know, plowing a whole new furrow kind of around that. Excuse the cliche, but I think um, uh, it's it's a it's something that could make this legislation so um, so transformative for children. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on now, Liam, then Oliver. Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, if I could maybe follow up a couple of points that have been raised by colleagues and then move on to a substantive point that hasn't yet been touched. Um, uh, Dr Scott, earlier on it was interesting you and probably rather refreshing your suggestion that you didn't necessarily anticipate the legislation if implemented having a dramatic effect immediately. Um, I, I would contrast that a bit with what we heard last week from the Crown Office and um, Police Scotland representatives 
who talked um, about their expectation that this would give a, a greater degree of confidence and certainty and, and that w what we would see was uh, an increase in, in, in numbers of, of, of women coming forward um, to, to, to raise uh, con concerns and complaints. Is that distinction just an, a, a, an order of, of time frame? Is your expectation that this legislation will indeed lead to what we were hearing last week would be an increase in, in, in referrals and reports? It is about time, probably as much. But it is also reflecting, I think, our understanding, and I think our colleagues in Police and Crown would, would support this, which is that some of the victims, of course, of control are already in the system. And, the, and it goes back to, John, what I was saying about the police and, and Crown Office are, are already trying to make to make their experiences, which they see as abuse, you know, um, fit in our current system to go into court. Um, I mean, any policy that's implemented generally takes quite a long time um, to have an impact, uh, uh, particularly something that, that relates to what is re really seriously the biggest violation of, of women and children's human rights in Scotland and, and has massive numbers attached to it. Um, I think uh, that the, the areas where it will have the most, where it will be the most challenge is not actually police and crown office, but it's health, social work, um, uh, the, the, the officials and the public sector that engage with women and children experiencing domestic abuse every day and never see them. Um, and that a bill around coercive control, if we have the capacity to help people in those areas, understand how their jobs can be, um, uh, how their outcomes can be delivered better, cheaper, um, with less harm to everybody and trauma. Then, um, then that will that will be the sea change in Scotland. But it will take time. I'll just follow up a couple of points um, that, that um, uh, Mari was was um, probing with you earlier in relation to non-harassment orders. Um, uh, is it right to say that you're, you're supportive of a, a system whereby um, such orders would have to be considered um, by the courts in, in, in relation to domestic abuse cases, or there would be a presumption that they would be applied? Because I think there's a, 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 a nuanced difference between those, those two. And the other point was in relation to um, coercive and controlling behaviour um, and the impact on children. I, I mean, I know that there is a concern around um, any requirement that the children has to be either present in the room or, 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 uh, or within earshot. Uh, but, but given what you've already described in terms of the context in which coercive and controlling behaviour takes place, a course of action over a period, then presumably the impact upon children would be viewed in a similar in a similar vein. It would be a course of behaviour over a period. So therefore, being within earshot or being in the room is, is rather irrelevant. I mean, would, would, the, would the legislation, to your mind, not be interpreted in relation to children in the same way as we would expect it to be children, uh, expect it to be interpreted in relation to, uh, to victims, uh, women victims? I can't remember what the first part of that first was. First one was on the non-harassment orders, oh, the presumption. Yes, oh, the, 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 the nuance mm. of that. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I can't really see any problem with presuming that there would be non-harassment orders, um, and and that you know, like like in some of the legislation around contact that we have, which doesn't get paid much attention to, um, uh, it should be that that if there is one not issued, then then somebody would have to make a really good case for why it wasn't appropriate. Um, so I absolutely do come down on the side of the stronger we can make that wording, um, uh, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Because obviously, from the numbers that I've just cited, even, even in the existing framework in which um, it's clear that they could be used more um, often and more appropriately, they are not to be made and I suppose the change is that there wouldn't need to be an application made it would simply be, it would fall to the court to have to consider so I, I, I'm not sure there's a huge difference other than perhaps setting the uh, the, the, the threshold for these being applied um, at, at um, perhaps a, a lower level than is, is being applied at the at the moment um, but yeah, well, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, at the moment, the difficulty that you have on harassment orders is that you have the, the PF has to ask for it. Um, and quite often, um, that 
doesn't happen. It's starting to happen on a more regular basis than it has been. Um, but even then, there's um, reasons that sheriffs will give as, as to why a non-harassment order isn't um, appropriate. And quite often that will be in relation to where there's children. Um, and that um, contact um, that has to be facilitated. That certainly has been an, um, a recent example um, from one of the women that we supported in the Highlands um, that the non harassment was asked for and the sheriff refused it as a result of um, there being um, the contact having to be facilitated. And the sheriff felt that that would um, impact on the father's um, rights to have access to the, the, the children. Um, when the PF has to ask for it, um, that, that's a, a difficulty because it becomes comes, um, it's not something that happens um, on a, a regular basis. So the change that's been proposed in here, I think that that's one of the things that will make a massive difference for, for um, women's safety, but, but also but just unless, in, Sorry, oh, I mean, sorry. Unless, unless it talks about the, the, the way in which it impacts on contact, in a sense, you're going to have the court arriving potentially at the same decision that, that if this interferes with contact, they won't apply a, a non-harassment order. I'm not sure whether the legislation will address those sorts of situations. But I think at that point, one of the things that we need to be looking at is, in, in those circumstances with this, if we're looking at the non-harassment order also impact applying to the children as well as the women, then and that's what we're asking the, the court to consider, um, then yes, at that point, it would impact on um, a father's rights to have access to a children. However, domestic abuse is a parenting choice and it impacts on the children and young people and therefore as a society we need to be saying that if your behaviour is impacting negatively on your children um, then actually if you can't behave in a way that's appropriate then do you have a right to have access to your children if you are um, impacting on them um, and if, you know if your behaviour is impacting on them negatively um, but I think you know um, having the courts um, actually um, the sheriff have to having to consider a non-harassment order as standard um, actually will be a, a big step forward um, because at the present moment in time, if a non-harassment order isn't provided, um, you're then having to look at going through the civil courts for an interdict, which takes time, takes a lot of stress, and distress can be caused through having to go through the, the civil part. But also in terms of women who work, they have, they, they have to pay for it. And if it's not defended, you're looking at at least £1,000. But if an interdict is defended, you're looking at upwards to about £10,000 it would cost someone to actually have a, an interdict. Um, so there's a, a, a barrier to justice there for, for pe people who are um, in work. Um, but also um, the, the process that you then have to go through if it's a, a civil interdict as opposed to it being a, a criminal non-harassment order. Some of the Justice Committee members um, heard from one of the women that we supported in your last um, inquiry into the operation of the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service um, and she spoke about um, how she's had a, um, a, an interdict with a power arrest for the last five years. The power arrest only lasts for um, three years and she's had to go back through the courts to have the power arrest um, re, um, to, to have the power arrest made again um, and that's then been breached and she's now in the process of trying to take it back through the civil courts to have the, inter the civil interdict um, um, you know, um, to have the court um, look at that um, and we're now a year almost down the road of when all this can kind of happened when he breached the interdict and she's still no further forward. Um, so there are massive, massive issues with how um, women get protect protection through the um, civil process. So actually having a criminal non-harassment order, which is imposed by the court, which actually says this is a standard of behaviour that we expect. And if you don't admit the standard of behaviour, then that is an offence and you will come back before the sheriff is actually something that will make a massive, massive difference. Just following up on a, on a separate, a substantive point, um, I, I think we've heard pretty much um, universal support um, for broadening a definition, recognising the, the, the extent to which domestic abuse happens in, in, in non-physical um, respects as well. But we've at the same time heard some concerns that the, the threshold for that um, abusive behaviour um, is perhaps lower than um, might be necessary. It's been uh, contrasted with the, the legislation introduced um, uh, south of the border from, from the end of, of 2015. Um, Andrew Dekel, um, in, in, in his evidence to us, suggests uh, the key aspect is ensuring that the thresholds for criminalisation are sufficiently high. In my submission, I direct you to the English legislation which provides uh, that the, the harm that is caused to the complainer has to be of sufficient severity and have a 
a significant impact on their day-to-day -day life. And he suggests that um, there's a risk that we, we, we criminalise what may be bad, possibly just unpleasant behaviour, uh, but not necessarily what, um, uh, what, what, what should be targeted as, as, as abusive but the coercive and controlling behaviour. Have you got any? I mean, I'm sure you've you've had an opportunity to um, to, to read and listen to the the, the contribution that uh, Mr. Tickell and others have, have made. What would be your response on that issue of of the thresholds? I think, and with all due respect, because I have lots of respect for Mr. Tickell, um, I think that's just a very academic and sophisticated way of saying it's just a domestic. Um, I think the. The contract, you couldn't have more contrast between this bill and the bill down south. Um, and our sister organizations down there say that it is not working well, that there are very few prosecutions and the ones that do happen, there is always physical violence involved um, and that a prosecution around coercive control is seen as the next best thing. So there's a hierarchy of harms which absolutely does not reflect our experiences um, uh, or women's experiences of course of control as the most harmful. Um, I think in terms of a threshold, this bill has, unlike the bill down south, which is quite a simple bill, and I think they failed to grasp the nettle of the complications of this, um, the, 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 the construct or the frame of this bill is about looking at the perpetrator's behavior rather than trying to prove some kind of harm with the victim. Um, and, uh, and focusing on a threshold of distress. Um, despite the fact that distress is already ex an existing concept used in Scottish legislation and in other laws, um, is, is again about, well, is this just a domestic? Are we somehow interfering in family life in ways that are inappropriate? But as you will well know, having looked at the, you know, this bill, there are multiple tests in this bill that, that mean that trivial behavior, um, mundane, um, bad behavior on the part of all kinds of folks and families um, are never gonna make it through the, those sets of tests. And, um, and I, there's no will in the system, really, to, to make that happen, I don't think. And I think the, the critical um, distinction... Sorry, just to stop you. On, yeah. on, on those, um, the safeguards, I suppose, mm -hmm. in, in terms of addressing the concerns that, that Mr. Tickell and, and two or three others have, have made, mm -hmm. what, would, what would those be, uh, to, to your mind? How, what, what would you say um, would give um, some confidence that, as mm -hmm. you say, that the, the distress levels which are, 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 are known and, and understood in, in the legislative context yep. in, in Scotland? Well, I would refer effective. you back to what um, Anne-Marie Hicks's testimony was because I think um, she said it quite eloquently about um, all the ways that uh, um, the, that the requirement for a course of behavior, that um, uh, the, the different tests in, um, in order to get a case even um, uh, robust enough into court mean that, that trivial events that seem, that, that are in fact just, just bad behavior, um, uh, well, and as Heather and I were talking about before, sometimes are, you know, responded to by police and should be appropriately, but are not what we would call a course of behavior. Um, I think the, the, the problem with looking at the threshold as an academic exercise, which I think Mr. Tickell did, um, uh, is that, th that that kind of um, uh, framework or perspective is not informed by what what we see is a, a much bigger problem in, this, in, in the existing status quo, which is the, the huge numbers of um, uh, cases of domestic abuse that never even come into the courts. So the legal academics never see them. You know, the, the um, professional societies never deal with these cases because the vast majority of them are just, just never wind up in the criminal justice system. This is a law that absolutely um, reflects the fact that, that we need to be able to criminalize coercive control. Now, there is no appetite from what I can gather for in the court system or in the police system for taking trivial bad behavior and creating um, a, a domestic abuse case out of it. And um, 
so, so I hear I hear from some of our colleagues that this is about intruding in, fa in family life, and I do have to say I I think that, you know, when family life um, delivers abuse and trauma and distress, um, uh, then 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 absolutely we should be interfering in family life, and we don't want that kind of a family life for anybody in Scotland, and um, and this focus on a threshold has. I think always been an attempt to to push um, the human rights aspect of women and children's experiences of domestic abuse out as as only applying in public sectors and and I'm so proud that this is a bill that actually challenges that and and I think that um, I can't really speak to the yes there will be you know uh, if and when this bill passes and gets implemented there will be misguided attempts to use it. I think my biggest fear, and, the, and I know our biggest fear in Scottish Women's Aid, is that, it, that perpetrators will try to use it to control women, because that's exactly what happens now with our existing um, legislation. But um, that, that's much more likely to happen, and even so, we are willing to take that chance in order to have an improved tool. Thank you. Okay. Can I just, I mean could I just add to that? In, you know, in terms of this, um, the definition and the thresholds that there has to be a course of conduct, it actually probably provides a bit more protection than the cur we currently have in terms of current legislation, where if you and me were in a relationship and we were out in the street and we had an argument, the police were called, that would be classed as a, a domestic um, incident, um, and one of us would end up in, in court and have to, to answer to that. Um, where, and, and, and you see that within our court system happens on a, a fairly regular basis, but that's not what we're talking about when, when we talk about women's um, domestic abuse. Domestic abuse causes fear. Um, it, it, it's about control and it's an ongoing pattern of behaviour where various tactics are being used and that's what this bill and the thresholds within it allows us to, to, to tackle. Um, so within the current law that we've got, um, you know, people who are not um, necessarily being um, using domestic abuse but are um, bad behaviour, which we're all perfectly capable of within our relationships, um, actually end up before the, the court this legislation with the thresholds that are built, it, built into it in relation to the, the, the course of conduct um, I, it is actually, I think, provides, a, a, it strengthens um, the, the basis from which we're, we're currently working from, where you do find um, people who have got a um, domestic um, assault history or, you know, there's um, a, a conviction in relation to that because of um, a, an argument that's happened between a couple, which, well, is not okay, is not what we would class as domestic abuse. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. The majority of the issues I was going to raise have, have sort of been touched upon, but I just wanted to return briefly uh, to the defence of reasonableness. Um, and I was sort of particularly interested in how that interacts with some of the cultural concerns uh, that we heard about right at the beginning uh, and whether or not, you know, behaviours which are maybe seen as being uh, normal or have been normalised within particular uh, families or cultural settings might sort of allow uh, people to use that defence more more easily. The reasonableness is some yeah it can be you you know in, it's made normal some of the behaviour of the perpetrators is normalised within the cultural context whether it's BME or it's the mainstream some of the acts are kind of accepted as normal thing. So I haven't read that document that you're talking about, reasonable. Um, it's in the law. It's yeah. in the law. Uh, but yes, you have to be very careful where you set this reasonable, you know, the threshold. It's very important because you don't want the perpetrators, not only the perpetrators, it's also the society to look at it as a normal behavior and there's nothing wrong with it and it's not domestic abuse. So. I, and I think, you know, I, I, I can't um, echo more eloquently than what Jerry said at the beginning, which is that um, uh, reasonableness, you know, or, or, you know, it's culture, or it's, you know, it's the drink, or, I mean, there, there are so many contexts in which abusive behavior is explained away in our society. Um, and what seems uh, 
unacceptable from one perspective is seen as eminently reasonable by perpetrators, I have to say. Um, uh, and I, I think that uh, the reasonableness, as, as um, previously said, uh, is a bit scary for us because domestic abuse was a perfectly reasonable response for centuries in Scotland. But um, I actually do have faith that the, the system, especially if it has the training that it needs to do this well, um, will use that test to, to set a new standard um, in courts, but also in Scottish society, about how it's reasonable to treat your partner and your, and your children. And that's, so, it depends for whom is it reasonable. Is it for the courts and for us, or it's for the women the behavior is reasonable? That's what we have to look at it. It's not for us to say that one behavior is reasonable. I have to look at, is it reasonable for the women? Does she feel it's reasonable, his behavior? is what is important, I think. And I'll give you one example. We always talk about this. We had a client where this is coercive control. And the guy would use just his lighter. So every time he would just say to her, if something he is not done or his control is that, he, he used to threaten her that I will burn you. So when the, when the statement was taken from the women, all that he did was there were other agencies around the table. There was a support worker and there's the police and everything else. All that he did was take his lighter out and put it on the table. That's all. And none of the other people understood what that lighter meant. For, for the woman, it meant a lot. So that is coercive control you know, that we, we can't see. So is it reasonable? Or is it not reasonable? And let me just say, so in the construct of this law, um, what it does is require us to understand the circumstances, the personal circumstances of the case, the context of the case, which is what I think the real strength of it is. So absolutely, if you look at it as an incident, putting a lighter on the table is, is a reasonable act. But a reasonable person, if they understand the full context of that relationship, would not think it was reasonable to threaten a woman with burning her, even if that threat that threat is nonverbal, and um, uh, and uh, is is referenced through putting a lighter on the table. Sure. Does that make sense? And and any but it is about understanding the behavior that a reasonable person would see the whole course of conduct. See, so it it, may, it makes sense, but what I. I then struggle with is if you think the threshold is correct and the thresholds correctly identify the types of behaviour that are required and we're not looking at the effect it would necessarily have on the individual, why the defence is, is needed at all and whether, you know, and just whether, yeah. you know, just, I, I, I don't, from the course of behaviour is then asking people to do something else in looking at all of the circumstances. I just wonder whether it's a way back in to then justifying some of the behaviours? I mean, certainly in terms of the, the work that we did with some of the women that we um, support with the original consultation and, and that idea of reasonableness was certainly one that they were concerned about, um, that it would um, be used in a, a way um, that would um, mean that their experiences weren't taken into, a, in, into account. And just like Giri gave you the example there with the lighter, I could give you a dozen similar um, examples. Um, but I think where, um, where the, the change in terms of what we've got now is about recognising that um, we're not taking an incident-based approach, but that we are actually looking at the full circumstances mm -hmm. of somebody's life and, and why um, something that they've done. So, for instance, I meet you in the in, in the shop and I say to you, I notice your son's got a new bike. I hope he doesn't have an accident. Now, that would appear to be a, a reasonable conversation, but that sets off a lot of distress because in the context of our relationship, um, you, you know, we, uh, what you were threatening was that, quite, that if um, I ever left or ever did anything that you weren't happy, that you would hurt my son. Mm -hmm. um, so when I've left you and I've met you in the shop and you've made that statement, it appears like a reasonable statement. Um, but when you take the full context of it, you can understand why that's then caused the harm and, and, and the distress that it's caused in this this bill does allow that. In terms of whether the defence of reasonableness is one that, um, personally, I think it, it can be used. I think it will be used, I think, particularly women with disabilities, where the partner is maybe also the carer. Um, I think potentially for BME communities. Mm -hmm. um, so, so but obviously that, it's in there for, for some 
reason somebody I thinks think, yeah, it needs the to be is, there. I believe yeah. that people were concerned that the threat that that the concerns were that the threshold would be too low and that trivial cases could get in. And so the 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 reason for putting it in there is as a safeguard. Um, I, I'm totally with you on that. If we didn't I, need a safeguard, I'd be happy with that. But I, I suspect there would be a, an outcry. I, I think the, the issue with that, if you're talking about trivial cases getting through, is the defence really only comes into play once the, once the, once the accused is sort of accused of the offence yeah, or yeah. charged. Yeah, no, I got you. So it's not going to filter people out at an early stage. No. The defence is only going to come into play once these cases go to court. And what I'm worried, having heard today, is just a sort of, come into my head, was the sort of idea, perhaps, that people's family members or other people who were involved in the situation would be brought in to give their view on whether or not um, uh, particular incidents were reasonable and, and just the sort of the trauma that might be I mean, part of the yeah, part of the difficulty is is that you know none of us have a, a, a proper picture of what goes on within our, our, our families or our, our, our relationships' lives, um, and I think the difficulty with reasonableness is that Marsha's already said a lot of uh, uh, perpetrators of abuse believe that their behaviour is perfectly reasonable, um, that the things that they do are, are is actually okay, um, and I think it's um, you know. It, but that sometimes the responses from people who are experiencing abuse on the outside don't always appear completely um, reasonable. Um, so that's one of you know, the concerns that I certainly have in, in, in relation to that, because you know, all you see is that response to a text message, which isn't threatening necessarily, um, or a comment that somebody's made, and, and that's then triggered this, um, you know, the whole fight or fight, or you know, it, it, it's triggered that fear within somebody, um, and you're seeing the response to that, which doesn't always appear to be completely reasonable, but that response is because of the course of conduct that has been through that, that the entirety of that relationship, and what this bill does is it moves us away from looking an incident-based response because domestic abuse is not about a incident. It's about the tactics and the patterns of behaviour that impact. But I, I, yeah, but I that's, agree. That's going to yeah. work both ways on the defence as well because, yeah. I mean, effectively you could be bringing children or parents in, uh, mm. of, you know, of, of the victim to, to talk about, you know, long-term <laughs> courses of behaviour, uh, perhaps issues around mental health or issues around disability and there might be aspects of unreasonable behaviour on on both sides uh, but it might not be you know it, it wouldn't necessarily mean that the domestic abuse isn't there somewhere but it might be possible to, to sort of paint a, a different picture uh, as a result and I just I, that's all that worries me. But again, it comes back to when I was um, talking at the beginning that, uh, like you were saying, you know, the physical abuse takes place after a lot of coercive control has happened. And also, you're talking about bringing family members as witnesses. And in, in BME communities, the effort is to save the marriage so actually your own parents can go against you. And then they actually give evidence against you, saying that it's not him, it's my daughter's behavior. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the point yeah. I'm, I'm worrying it, about. Uh, believe me, it happens. And actually it surprised me working for Shakti for 18 years, how many times I heard that her own family don't want to support her and her own family want to take her life away and I can never understand why. So th yeah, you will have that. And th that's something again, the solicitors and the lawyers, the legislative judges, they all have to be mindful of that that can happen. And I think it happened recently in a forced marriage case in Glasgow where they brought in um, the previous, um, the sisters of this victim who left home and gone away and they actually brought those people to kind of give evidence to say that the parents are perfect and they have never um, were against you know, their wishes and all. That was all rubbish. You know, it wasn't. The, the young person was looking for an opportunity to, opportunity to get back with the family. So this is one opportunity they got. Just support the family and they, can, they are welcomed back into the family. So you can't really, I don't know, it makes it difficult, but you can't really trust what they say. And, and I think what you're saying is you're concerned about the reasonableness being used as a way to mitigate 
in some way, bringing people in to mitigate the perpetrator's behavior. Um, and, and I think it's um, uh, important, and I'm j I was just looking at the, trying to find the exact language around it, but I think it was conceived of as a, as a mechanism um, to allow us to focus on the perpetrator's behavior without having to, pro to prove specific harms to a victim. Um, and there's a whole lot of good reasons for why that is, which we undoubtedly don't have time for. Um, but I think that was, the, in the drafters of the bill, I think the, the, the reasonableness um, needed to be there for the very few small cases in which there was um, uh, some reasonable explanation for a series of behaviors that might, on the outside, look abusive. Um, and so in the context, perhaps, of somebody who has, um, who the, uh, who has uh, guardianship of somebody, um, and it's their job to control certain things that, in a in a uh, independent relationship, they should never be controlling. Um, uh, but also to allow mechanisms for keeping the focus on the perpetrator's behavior rather than the impact on the victim. I hear your concerns and I share them, but I think in the in the long run, um, we we would rather have the risk be on that side than to move to a, um, a bill that required proving harm, which is enormously problematic. Okay, no, that's, that's super. Um, it was just a slightly different question, which leads on uh, just when we're talking about family relationships and other bits and pieces, do you think that the offence covers all of the relevant parties, or do you think we should be looking more perhaps at sort of elder abuse, mm -hmm. the use of other family members, how it all interacts. Yeah. Do you think that it's too narrow just looking at partners, ex-partners? Um, considering that we've fought for 20 years to keep this definition, possibly my answer to that would be no, I'm <laughs> very happy with it. I will say, as one of, before I ever worked for Scottish Women's Aid, I was one of a team of um, University of Edinburgh researchers who did the first research in Scotland, or in the UK actually, on older women and domestic abuse. Um, and I can tell you that, the, that what we found was, was shocking about the invisibility of older women um, in police reports, in social work assessments, in all kinds of things. But the problem there was not that they weren't covered by the law. They were absolutely covered by the law. The problem was that the minute they got over a certain age, then it begot, became defined as elder abuse. And people who ordinarily would respond robustly in the face of domestic abuse to a younger woman didn't see it, didn't identify it, and didn't respond appropriately. So um, from our perspective, and I know there will be some people <laughs> who will provide evidence uh, to the contrary, um, we think that there are adequate um, uh, uh, protections in this bill for people of all ages um, if it's used appropriately. The difficulty, of course, is that is that the service providers who are providing services for older women and older men need to understand domestic abuse, which is the, the biggest problem. I know, I suspect Yuri and I might uh, disagree on, on other family members, um, but we are really committed to Scotland continuing in its proud tradition of understanding this as gender-based violence, and we are, we are absolutely concerned that if you start to broaden it, then we have we have this bill being confused with child abuse legislation, with a whole variety of other difficulties that, um, that take our eyes off the prize of gender. Um, ben, followed by Fulton, then Stuart. Thank you, Camilla. A large amount of the areas in which I wanted to, to ask questions on have been covered, but there are a couple of, uh, one specific and, and one uh, general uh, query. In terms of the specifics, I just wanted to absolutely clarify, there's been some discussion in previous committees around the inclusion of recklessness within the definition. And I just wanted to, I know at Scottish Women's Aid, you, you, you clarify your support for it within in your written statement, but it would just be good to, to hear from others and, and yourself as to, to why uh, you agree with the, the inclusion of that. And uh, secondly, the Brown and Crockett Fiscal Service uh, mentioned in their written submission that the around the gender-based violence point that you, you just made, uh, Dr Scott, that uh, the, the bespoke offence will raise awareness and, and confidence in, in terms of uh, increasing the amount of uh, cases coming forward, but also trying to advance and progress social change in order to tackle gender-based violence more widely. And I, w I wondered if you could comment on the bill's potential uh, in that context. Absolutely. Um, 
I think I referred before to the fact that, uh, that for 40 years we've been hearing stories about the impact of domestic abuse of, in the context, or in the form of course of control on, on women and children. Um, and the, the, the failure to have a legal instrument that would respond to the, what they have told us for 40 years um, sends a powerful message to women and children that their experiences of trauma are not of of that much interest to to us as as, legal, as people who make policy and law in Scotland. Not that I make policy and law, although happy to try. Um, uh, and I think the, the the fact that we had such powerful testimony from the Crown Office and the police were the folks, along with our services, who are closest to the coalface, who are closest to the to the to the experiences that you heard about in this evidence session that, are, that our survivors provided, um, uh, that, that they have been trying to make law that is not fit for purpose um, work in these cases. And it is in your gift as lawmakers to send a message that says that's not good enough anymore in Scotland and that we are listening to the voices of survivors and service users um, and the people who have never come into our system because they don't recognize their experiences in the things that we respond to. Um, and, and this is an opportunity for Scotland to stand above actually every other legislature that has, has made laws around domestic abuse and coercive control. If this bill gets passed, as Evan Stark says, it will be the gold standard for um, uh, statements, both in law, but um, in morality about what is okay. Uh, and um, I, I can't imagine um, that we would wanna walk away after the 10 to 15 years that it has taken us to get to this point. Um, absolutely, the detail can be debated and should be debated, um, but the, the challenge is clear uh, in terms of law that fits, that, that acknowledges women and children's rights as human rights. And, and the opportunity is huge, I think. And, and um, the, the statement that it allows us to make as a service provider uh, and as a policy advocacy to women and children saying, you are being listened to, your lives do matter, um, your experiences count, and um, and yes, we we will be part of the transformation uh, of your community. That means that um, if this happens to you, that there is accountability in the system, and that you should come forward, and you should expect protection, and you should expect support. I know I've had a wee rant there, but I, I I thank you for that question because I think it's easy to get caught up in the the nuts and bolts of legislation, especially because that's what you all do. But from our perspective, the ability to go out to the 36 service communities in which our services are based and say, you have a bill that reflects what you have said you would like the Scottish Parliament to do about domestic abuse in Scotland. Now let us all make it so. It is um, a consummation devoutly to be wished. Thank you. And uh, just from I think Gray, in terms of inclusion of recklessness, just for clarity, oh. are, you, are you supportive of, of that? You want me to? Yeah. Um, in terms of recklessness, that, that's very much connected, I think, with some of the discussions we are having um, about reasonableness, which is what are what are the the hurdles in the bill that um, that ensure uh, that 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 this law will not be used for trivial purposes or to prosecute. Um, uh, people who are not being abusive or, um, and we, we quite like the concept of recklessness because it again helps us create uh, a focus on the, the abusive behavior rather than on the impact of the victim. Um, so in, instead of having to prove, which as I said is hugely problematic, um, uh, whatever serious harm might be, which is, which is what's in the law, the law down south, um, what we have is uh, a, a statement about somebody either knowing that something is harmful or being reckless in the face of it. And recklessness in that context is not a new concept 
for us in law, and I think it's it's quite a nifty application of it here, to be honest. Um, nifty not having a lot of gravitas, I understand, but um, in the in the sense that it, it's a it's a mechanism that that comes quite easily to hand in terms of well, you should have known. If you did not know, you're you know you should have known. And and we talk about reckless driving. We talk about all kinds of things that are that are at, at that test of recklessness. And I think in this bill, it's it's quite a good tool for helping us create a robust case that abuse has happened, um, and uh, without having to prove um, uh, harm. Does that it, does that reply specifically yeah, yeah. enough? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Conscious of time, so if the, the questions and the responses could be as succinct as possible, that would be very helpful. Fulton, followed by Stuart. Yeah, thanks, convener. <coughs> thanks, panel, for uh, your evidence today. Evidence uh, that I think has been very rich and that I personally uh, agree with uh, fully. And it's great to see uh, all three of you so enthusiastic about the, the legislation. Come back to the, um, the issue of uh, non harassment orders. You talked about why they should be used more, uh, which I agree with, uh, as I said, but can you talk about why, how you, you think they could be made ro more robust when they are used? Um, I know it's a small number that you cited earlier being used, but um, my own experience from uh, being a social worker before being elected is that in many respects they, they, they're not particularly effective as well. And Have you got any ideas how they could perhaps be more uh, robust? I mean, we've... You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes the, the, the non-harassment orders um, aren't um, as effective as they could be, and part of that is about how they are then policed. Um, there's a specific example I, I can give you is of a, a woman that we've worked with for um, quite some time, and a non-harassment order was finally um, imposed as part of the um, sentence. Um, and the non-harassment order has been breached on a number of occasion, occasions and it was finally taken back to court and then it was there was there was nothing happened basically because it didn't meet a, a, a sufficiency of, of evidence um, and I think part of that is is that you know um, the breaches of non-harassment order can be a bit like um, a lot of the time it's that kind of stalking and harassing kind of behavior that's ongoing that's seen as being low level um, so for instance the car driving by and revving the engine um, you know all times of the the, the night um, all of being at the school um, when she's going to pick up the kids, you know, those those types of things. Um, and I think it, it, it's it's that that sometimes I think trips it trips it up is that it's not seen as being it's not a threat. It's not me coming up to you and saying you know you're a, using offensive language or threatening a behaviour. Um, and I think that that's the difficulty is that our system doesn't police that particularly well. We expect that when we talk about domestic abuse that the, the behaviour is abusive, that it's me shouting at you or it's me using offensive language or actually threatening. Um, whereas a lot of the time the behaviour is more subtle than that. And, the, and it, at this point in time, it doesn't um, lend itself to policing that particularly well. However, with the new legislation, that type of behaviour would potentially be covered and a lot more, um, or there's more scope for that to be um, dealt with. And I think it is about having to get ourselves away from the idea that domestic abuse is about threatening abuse in, in, in that respect, um, that we can intimidate people in lots of different ways. Um, you know, I suppose one that comes to mind and we've used recently in schools that we work in is the debate between Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump. Um, you know, how did he try to intimidate her? Um, you know, it was by invading her personal space. David Davis and Leanne Wood on Question Time recently, you know, he went over and, and staring. There's lots of different ways in which, you know, we can in, intimidate and, and try and um, get, get to control people that aren't necessarily overtly threatening. Um, and the current system focuses on that kind of overtly threatening behaviour. And if it's not in that way, we're not particularly good at following up and the court's dealing with that. Um, whereas hopefully with this new legislation, um, it kicks clearly states that it doesn't necessarily, you know, it, it gives the leeway for it not necessarily having to be that overtly threatening behaviour, which gives some hope for actually being able to improve the lives of those that are affected by domestic abuse, because it actually fully breaks down what domestic abuse is and doesn't just focus on a, th a incident or a thing. Let me just add to that, I think there are some, there is some opportunity, um, and it's a bit of a techie uh, response, I suppose, but um, 
uh, for better use of some of the technology, for instance, in the, the um, uh, electronic monitoring and those, those kinds of things that we are just beginning to explore, I think, in Scotland. And it would be very, um, um, I think that it would add some robustness to policing and responses if, if we explored and invested in electronic monitoring um, capacities to support some of the policing. It would, it would help provide evidence, but it also would provide a, a significant amount of um, reassurance to some women who are, who are not convinced that the, that the perpetrator is going to abide by a, um, a non-harassment order and, and this is an important and, and that if and when he breaches it, that the police will respond appropriately. But I think the, the opportunity to, to support some of that policing with um, technology is uh, uh, potentially fruitful. Do you think as well that, and I know this is something that will maybe only develop once the bill is implemented and, and, uh, and work in an area you've, you've talked about as well, but do you think that um, in terms of how these uh, non-harassment orders are actually managed, um, that, that there's, there's work that can be done around you know, what work has been done with the offender and what work has been done with the victim um, and, and where that fits into the, the length of time that maybe a non-harassment order uh, is in place. Because obviously, like anything, you wouldn't expect a, a non-harassment order to be a, an indefinite a, thing. However, it, you know, the, the, the nature of that relationship might not change forever, or it might not change um, at all, um, or, or it might take a long time to change. So I think that there is work to be done there as well. And I just wondered, uh, very briefly, given what the convener said, what your thoughts are on that? Well, I th go ahead. I mean, the, the reality is, is that you know, in terms of the outcomes at court, that there's not work, enough work being done with perpetrators of uh, abuse. Um, you know, the, the, the system in terms of the Caledonia project, etc., is very, very sketchy across the whole of Scotland. The Highlands, for instance, um, there is, a, you know, there's the respect work gets done on a one-to-one -one basis, but it's only with very, very few um, perpetrators, and it's those that are seen as being at the Kenny higher Kenny end. Um, and, and the difficulty is, is that unless we address the behaviour, um, then they will either go on and continue to abuse that partner or they'll find another partner and they'll start to abuse them. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's the, the perpetrator's abuse behaviour that needs to be um, addressed and at the moment we're not particularly great at, at doing that. If I'm not mistaken, there actually have been, um, and maybe these are down south, but uh, some lifetime non-harassment orders. So, I mean, I, I, th I think that's a tool that will be used very, very rarely, but potentially um, needed in, in rare cases. Um, and, but I do think there's a continuum, exactly as you describe, of response, uh, and that there, there would be an opportunity for work with perpetrators, which I am not an expert on, um, uh, to integrate um, behavior in, in compliance and non-compliance around a non-harassment order into understandings of how behavior change is needed in order for a perpetrator to, be, to um, uh, uh, respond appropriately to whatever treatment is being offered. For the BME, implementing the harassment orders is a bit complicated, like I mentioned before, because of the family dynamics and the extended family members. There might be a harassment orders on the man, but to implement them is difficult because in one case, for example, Caledonian were in, involved in supporting the man and we were involved in supporting the women, but the, and there were interdicts and all, but the thing was the children were taken to the grandparents' house where the man would visit. So he's actually not breaking any rules. He's not asked not to visit the, his family home. So he was visiting and the women would leave the children there she didn't want to, but again, it's because of the family pressure. And she's actually not telling us that that's what she's doing. So for that, she's being blamed because she's the one who's putting the children at risk by taking them to the grandparents' house. And he, was with, he would visit the children there and see. So, I, so implementing is sometimes mm -hmm. quite complicated. So maybe these things, when you're forming a bill you have to take into consideration. How are we then going to protect women from being blamed from these kind of situations? That's all I want to say. And it happens more often, although I gave you one case 
a scenario, but it ha happens more often. There was one woman, there were interdicts on the guy, but she was and no recourse to public funds, so she had nowhere to go. Therefore, her in-laws, who are parents of the husband, offered her uh, shelter. They said she could stay with them. So he was visiting his parents, and there were no interdicts for him not to visit his parents' home. So how are you actually going to implement unless you have some kind of um, additional uh, legislation to protect women from that kind of thing. So actually, in that case, she is the one who is breaking the rules. It's not him by allowing him to come in. So. Yes, we are very much over time now. So, Stuart, if you could. Thank you, Ms. Fabry. I just wanted, because I've heard different views at different times from the panel, whose reasonableness is it? Because clearly, when we're in court, there are three reasonablenesses. There's the perpetrator's view of reasonableness, the victim's view of reasonableness, and a societal view, or the bench's view of reasonableness. And I just want to be clear where you think we should go in this, and in particular, where the victims are concerned. There may be victims where the abuse over the long term has been of such a character as for the victim to normalize the behavior to the extent they no longer realize that the behavior of the perpetrator is unreasonable. Secondly, the victim may lack mental capacity, in particular in older couples where the victim may, for example, be uh, suffering from dementia and therefore lack the mental capacity to make any assessment of whether reasonableness in relation to the behavior of the perpetrator. So whose reasonableness is it? And in particular, given that judges will tend to come from a particular social strata <coughs> that may be disconnected from the day-to-day -day experience of the wider public, where does reasonableness come? And I finally say, I'm quite convinced we should not incorporate a definition of reasonableness in the legislation because the facts and circumstances have to be brought to bear. Now, that was a long question. Can I have a short answer? The very opposite of well, a succinct question, but if you could have succinct answers, please. Quickly, I will yeah. try really hard to be quick. Um, first of all, if you're under the illusion that domestic abuse doesn't happen in um, the homes where there are judges, let's, That's just, all right. let's just out that That's one. That's all right. Um, uh, secondly, I'm, and I'll, I've pulled up uh, some text from our response, so there's a reference here, but um, it says, we'd suggest that since the defense of reasonableness specifically states that the course of behavior was reasonable, reasonable in the particular circumstances, mm -hmm. um, that this wording is replicated in relation to the references to the reasonable person's consideration of the behavior. So in other words, it's reasonable that a reasonable person would consider the course of behavior in the particular circumstances to be likely to cause B to suffer physical or psychological harm. So really, while all of this is quite interesting, I think your, point, your question is really on point, which is, we are talking about the reasonableness of the people in the courtroom who are making the judgment about whether a crime has occurred and whether this particular perpetrator is the person who uh, who um, uh, did can the I, crime. So I, that's that's what that's the point around which reasonableness so can I just must draw respond. It because I, I know the convener is on my shoulder properly. So the test of reasonableness is determined outside the relationship, not yes. inside it. Absolutely. Right, that's probably it, Kimbina. Okay, thank you. There's just one thing I thought, Heather, you want the opportunity to, to come back at this. The example that you used was outside the family one in connection to non-harassment orders, um, the Hillary Clinton one, Donald Trump one, <laughs> and the, the David Davis, Leanne Wood. And I don't think you would want to muddy the waters because there is a oh, real fear I, um, yeah. about the, the, the far-reaching consequences yeah. of this legislation. I suppose it was just to give an example of how, um, how intimidating behaviour can be, how we can intimidate people without, and, and, and those two are ones that yeah. were very clearly in the public eye, but you see that type of, you know, often, um, as I say, the, the difficulty of the, the current situation in terms of the current legislation and the current law and the way that it's enacted is that we focus on violence, we focus on actual threats, we focus on what we 
as a society would think is abusive behaviour. So f I have to swear at you, you know, for yeah. that to be um, seen as being abusive. I think that was important yeah. to get on record. Then can I, I pose one last question? And it seems to me germane to the whole thing. We think there is a gap in the legislation, most definitely. And that's the coercive uh, behaviour gap. How is it triggered? That's the thing. There's a course of conduct, yes, certainly. Uh, and I noticed specifically in the women's aid um, submission that don't ignore the existing law that's there, the stalking, the other. But how is it triggered? Especially when, Jiri, I think at the very beginning in your evidence, you said it can be going on for years and years. And at the point where suddenly they say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> then it may materialize into violence. So can it stand alone? as an offence. Do we have enough for that? I think absolutely. I mean, in terms of my experience of the, the time that I, I've worked, done direct uh, um, delivery work quite often, the, the first time someone will contact us at Women's Aid, the first thing they'll say to us is, I don't know if you can help me because he's never hit me. Yeah. Um, and um, they'll then come in or we'll speak to them and you will unpick the, a relationship where there's a huge, huge amount of um, coercive control and behaviour, which has an absolute negative impact on that woman's um, physical integrity in terms of her belief in herself, in terms of her mental well-being. Um, and I, so I, I think that there's lots of ways in which this can uncover itself. You know, Marsha was saying about health and social care professionals. I would actually say that a lot of health and social care professionals are actually really good, particularly like health visitors and, you know, um, and, and saying to women that actually there's maybe a, a, an issue here. Your relationship sounds like um, that, you know, is, is, are you happy with your relationship, that there's a, a high level of control and that you should maybe go and speak to, to women's aid. So there's there's people who are involved in, in families' lives or who come into contact with women or even friends and family who are actually able to say you've, you've changed because actually you're no longer the person that you were, you know. Um, and there's a lot of this when there maybe has been physical violence comes out when women are talking to the police, but we can't do anything about it um, mm. because it's it's not part of that specific incident that I want that I'm you, you're giving a statement about. But usually, um, something triggers that the face of violence or enough is enough in leaving. Mm -hmm. Or someone's involved with a family and, and notices yeah. that, that difference. It could be a family friend, it could be a, you know, a family member, um, or it may just be that some, for, a, for a woman, it's actually she's, she's recognised that there's something's not right and she's tried to fix it within herself because quite often that's where it starts, is that we will take responsibility for what's happening to ourselves and we'll try and change. So we'll make sure that dinner's on the table at the right time, we'll make sure that we cut our hair, wear our hair in a certain way or that we don't talk to our mums or our friends. Yeah. And when that doesn't work and the abuse continues that's at the point that you start to then re recognize that actually maybe the fault doesn't lie with you that it lies with the the person who's telling you that it's your fault and that it's your behavior that causes yeah. this okay thank you I, I, I think it's difficult to evidence coercive control whereas physical abuse is easier to the so coercive control takes much more listening and investigation to prove I think you need longer time to spend. Mm -hmm. and for that reason, we shouldn't actually abandon the bill because that's what we are trying to help women who are suffering coercive control. So we shouldn't be fearful of investigation and listening. One okay. quick yes, absolutely. footnote on all of that. I absolutely agree. Um, and I think that the trigger, I'm, I'm hoping that the trigger will come sooner. Absolutely, women call us all the time and say, I'm not sure this is domestic abuse. Um, um, because I think we, we have this notion, why doesn't she just leave, is, is about that, that she doesn't mind being abused. And I think our experience is that no one likes it, but the, the gendered expectations of women, and particularly if you look at the services we have for, for um, very young women, that um, tell them that they're supposed to be this person. And... Uh, and that when we, when young women have the same aspirations for for um, having the the space for action that all human beings are have a right to, then whether it's economic or or being able to have their voice in parliament or whatever it is, um, those triggers will happen a lot sooner and perpetrators will have far fewer tools for it. So it is a bit about being ambitious for for women and girls.
That's been a long but very worthwhile evidence session, bringing out um, a lot of things that will help our scrutiny of this bill. So I can I thank the witnesses very much and suspend briefly for a change of witnesses and a five-minute comfort break.
I welcome my second panel of witnesses on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill, Ronnie Barnes, Trustee Action on Elderly Abuse Scotland, Alan McCluskey, Director of Operations, Kevin Kane, uh, Parliamentary Policy and Research Officer, Victim Support Scotland. And following a late change to our agenda, Abused Men in Scotland is represented by Alison Walk, who is the trustee of the organisation. You're all very welcome. Um, can I thank uh, the witnesses from Elder Abuse and VSS for providing written submissions, always extremely helpful for the committee. And I move now to questions from, um, from members. Can I perhaps start and look at the, the relationships covered? Um, I know this will be of particular interest to action on elderly abuse and to see if it should go further than partners and ex-partners. Thanks, Chair. Um, we feel that because there's particular issues to do with people as they get older, that to confine it only to partners or ex-partners would perhaps be too restrictive because people do find themselves living with sons and daughters and other extended family members who then become caregivers. And I think that in circumstances like that, there is the likelihood, and certainly in our experience, uh, abuse and exploitation and all manner of uh, behaviours like that do occur. And I think in order for a, the, this bill to properly protect older people, it does need to, in, to, to enlarge, if you like, the, the concept of who we're talking about here in terms of who are likely to be the perpetrators and who are likely to be the victims. Furthermore, we think that there should be a specific aggregated of, uh, offence for abuse of older people because we believe that not enough priority is given in the criminal justice system to the prosecution of offences against older people, given the numbers of older people that there are and the rise that there will be, and the fact that older people require to be looked after in all manner of circumstances and situations. The good thing is we're all living longer. We're all living healthier lives, but at certain points, we are all going to become vulnerable and frail. And this is not just something for a constituency of people out there. This is about all of us. And I think it's something that, in terms of uh, developing laws and protections, is something we should be considering. Uh, I, n there is no doubt that um, there is a real issue there, but I suppose the question is, is this the appropriate bill to put it in? It's called the Domestic Abuse Bill. It's very much, we've heard from some of the witnesses, looked upon as a gender-based bill. Um, Without doubt, then, neighbours, um, people looking after, it's not even family, you know, can be the perpetrators of abuse of the elderly. So it was really just to, I think the fear from some of the witnesses, and I know you were both listening to the, um, to the evidence, was that it would then in some way water down this specific coercive control within a relationship that they, they want to, to make sure is, is covered that um, hasn't been in the past. The question to yourselves as politicians is, if this is not the right bill, then what is? Yeah. But I still think we have to address the fact that this is a significant and serious and growing problem in terms of abuse of older people. It yeah. cannot be shied. And I think our charity will continue to campaign to ensure that eventually we do get an aggravated offence, which recognises the degree and type of offence that is happening day and daily. We're also concerned about the fact that the criminal justice system doesn't particularly take it seriously and that the low level of reporting results in the low levels of serious prosecutions mm -hmm. and the fact that we don't see the courts marking the fact that these offences are serious and uh, giving sentences that uh, reflect that. And that's something we think should be addressed as well. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the panel? Uh, Kevin? Yeah, we, we will absolutely take cognizance of, of, of that view uh, as, a, as a group who supports all victims. Uh, however, uh, as mentioned um, by Women's Aid earlier on, I think it is important that uh, we restrict it to partner and ex-partners ex and that that tallies with what we know about domestic abuse and what we know in terms of um, figures we've got to hand. Um, based on last year's figures, as an example, out of all homicides in the UK, 44% of female victims are killed by a partner or an ex-partner. So I think that highlights once more the gender dynamic that's at play here and how specific 
the offence needs to be. And I think as it stands, Victim Support Scotland um, are, are comfortable that it's between partners and ex-partners for that reason. Okay. There, there is a danger, perhaps, taking on Ronnie, uh, Ronnie's point, absolutely, but there is a danger that the bill may be weakened. And I think there's a real strength in the bill on, uh, on the focus and, the, and the, the scope as it stands. So I think to perhaps dilute it, there are, there, and there is other legislation, rightly for, uh, to protect older people. Um, and I think we, we concentrate on that, whereas this bill is about domestic abuse, domestic violence, uh, and both the, the psychological and, the, and, the, and the, the aspect of violence. And I think that's the strength that we want to see taken forward. Um, so otherwise, if we widen that scope of definition, it may uh, lose a bit of traction. And this bill is a very important piece of legislation that we very much welcome. Uh, Alison, did you have anything to add? I would have agreed with Ronnie, actually, because I feel it's abuse taking place in a home. And the victim has no way of escaping. They have to live there and um, keep returning there. And to me, I would, I, I would have included it. But so it's, would that not, be it's in not the, my speciality. That would be in the wider uh, context of the, the family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, anything else? I just think that uh, it shouldn't be beyond us to be able to frame and to uh, put into clauses the, the, the fact that it, it, it won't weaken the bill about perpetrators in terms of partners. But I think to, have, to miss the opportunity to not include the fact that people are living in domestic situations, being looked after by other caregivers, and not to include them in this bill will be a real grave mistake, because I'm not sure that the law as it stands, covers the sort of situations I'm talking about. Okay. Stuart. Um, I'm the only septuagenarian here, so this is more relevant to me personally. I've just been considering, um, for example, some of the provisions I've made, one of which is power of welfare, uh, which I've given to two family members and then a third younger person in case they're not alive at the time. I would not necessarily be living with a person who has power over my life and my circumstances, how my hair's cut, where I stay, and so on and so forth. How should that interaction with my making a choice in the last few years, as I've done on that front, be with what happens subsequently when I become incapable of exercising? Um, my own power to make decisions. Where does the line cross? Because what I have said about my future care, for example, I've said if I'm unaware of my surroundings, get the cheapest possible provision. Don't put me in a posh home or anything. Would that be caught by the reasonable test that people might think in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it might be, that that's unreasonable. Sorry, sorry uh, Stuart. I think we're very well served with having good adult support and protection legislation in Scotland, mm. as opposed to what happens in the rest of the United Kingdom. So I think we're very good at protecting people and taking account of their wishes and their needs and their requirements. But what we're not good at is determining when that strays into criminal behaviour. And I would have thought that the threshold in terms of what is criminal behaviour could be clearly understood. If people are being exploited and abused and uh, assaulted in whatever ways. Uh, I think that should be clearly defined and I don't think there should be any confusion about whether or not it's at the soft end of, you know, caregiving. It's not suggesting it's not a complex area because clearly it is. And any familial situation where people are both caregivers and have responsibilities which they find difficult and therefore perhaps, in, in, in a sense, by default become abusers, is the determination as to what you do about that. And as I say, there's probably adequate uh, protection uh, legislation in terms of adult support and protection to deal with situations like that when people recognise that they're getting into difficulties. But we're talking about sort of behaviour that is not acceptable. It's criminal in its intent, and it's to deal with situations like that. Because whether we like it or not, People do get abused. People do get violated. And I think we've got to understand that. And it's not trying to pretend that somehow you can sort of soften it away by saying it's just to do with the circumstances and you've got to understand the perpetrator actually is under pressure as well. 
in those circumstances, there's ways in which you can deal with that. But I'm saying abuse is abuse. Let's deal with it and call it what it is. Uh, John, followed by Mary, then Oliver. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning, panel. Thanks for your evidence. A, a question up, following on, Mr Barnes, if I may, from that. I don't know if you heard the example that Dr Scott gave about the non-visibility of domestic violence as someone gets older, that it's, it's, it, it, could you comment on that? Because I thought that was quite a, a powerful statement that, that Well, she I made. think what we also know is it's a vastly underreported situation. Yeah. We saw something in the research that we did last year, and this is mostly in England and Wales, something like only 6% of what we regard as criminal behaviour is actually reported. People are very reluctant to come forward. And we know this from our helpline. But just to give you an example of some of the behaviours that do go on, in 2013, uh, in terms of financial abuse, just let's take financial abuse, over six, of, of, the six, of 680 calls that we received to the helpline, we uncovered £25 million worth of abuse. And that was people being defrauded, having money stolen from them, coerced out of their homes, having their homes stolen. That was the total monetary value. And interestingly enough, although we did a press release at the time, not any of the national papers took that up. There is a real lack of under-reporting on issues to do with older people. You will get the odd sensational thing that will come out. But people are dying at the hands of their families and other sort of cruel perpetrators. And these things are not actually being picked up. But that's the scale of the problem we're talking about. It's under-reported because people are probably reluctant to come forward. And also, they're in this kind of relationship with people who are their caregivers, for whom they are dependent. But we've got to find the line of ensuring that there's a kind of a zero tolerance and regard abusive older people in the same way that we do with child protection. It's something that's unacceptable. And until we sort of make that mark and make those statements, I'm afraid the situation is going to continue. But remember, this is about all of us. This is not about some group of people out there, don't know, somebody. We're all likely to be finding ourselves in some vulnerable situations at some times in our lives. And we may well be dependent on others. We need to ensure that the law is robust enough to deal with situations when abuse is not anything other than what it is. It's abuse. Yep, you, you do touch on the underreporting in detail, Mr. Barnes, a, a number of, of issues that you, you, you cite as including people coming forward, fear of loneliness, threats have been placed in a home, embarrassed to report their own children or family members, feeling yes. they're a burden, unable to find words to explain. Um, go going back to the comment about um, some of this could be picked up at the moment um, as straightforward assault. Yes. Or, um, some could be picked up as domestic violence. On the particular point, and Dr Marsha Scott uh, from Scottish Women's Aid said there was a concern that older people, as, as people became older, they became invisible in the sphere of uh, domestic violence, domestic abuse, which is what we're focusing on here, gender-based violence in particular, which predominantly is, is uh, violence by men against women. Do you not feel that there's um, an enhanced position for older people in any case where this bill to progress? Well, I'd like to think so, but I still think that we would miss a trick if we didn't actually be more specific but who we regard as being covered by this, and t particularly in terms of who the perpetrators are. And just to m send a signal that, in fact, abuse of older people is, is not to be tolerated. And I think that's something that we don't really have in the, in the current criminal code, because I think the police probably find it difficult to prosecute certain circumstances. There's the reliability or otherwise of witnesses. Older people themselves may not be very credible, and yet, particularly when you've got issues to do with dementia and people's, you know, lack of sort of mental capacity. How then do you find that people who are likely to end up in court, how are they going to become credible? So I think there's a kind of a, a way of which, if you like, people are being diverted and discouraged from following through on issues where they are being sort of violated and abused in whatever the circumstances. So it's trying to find a means by which we all take this seriously. The other things that we're also concerned about is that uh, again, in our research, uh, as you'll see in our submission, at, of, of over 18,000 crimes against older people, there were only 194 successful prosecutions. And most of the penalties are either police cautions, community service, or suspended or deferred sentences. I'm not suggesting you lock everybody up, 
but I think there are certain crimes where you would expect somebody to be in prison for a significant length of time because of the violation of trust. But the, the current sort of penal policy is that people are sort of, if you like, almost diverted from being sort of seriously dealt with. And it's not sending the right signals to future perpetrators that this is a serious matter. And that's what we want to do in the course of this, is to send the signal and to highlight this as a growing and prevalent problem that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mary, followed by Oliver. Thank you, convener. Um, Good morning. Um, I wonder if I could perhaps um, come to you, Alison, to ask you um, for a bit more detail around abused men in, in, in Scotland, because I was struck by a, a couple of comments that Mr Barnes made in response to a previous question where he said that um, elder abuse is underreported and it's, it's not always taken seriously. And I suspect in relation to male victims of, of um, domestic abuse, you could, you could almost say the same thing. And I wonder if you could perhaps comment on that. In an earlier um, panel session, um, Dr Scott said that um, as this legislation um, progresses, training um, will be critical, particularly in court of sheriffs and judges. And I would, I'm, I'm interested in your view specifically in relation to male victims of domestic abuse. And, and I, it also expands out into, if we think of the number of support organisations that are out there, the majority of them are, are female-based support organisations. So is, is there a, a real job of education to be done with all the support organisations to make sure they are absolutely gender neutral? Yes. <laughs> <That's a long laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> um, yes, we, we do have concerns that sometimes men are forgotten as, as are older people. And actually, the, the, the piece of research referred to by Dr Scott was actually about older women and not older men, so mm. we don't really know much about older men. Either, um, as for training, we very strongly believe that there needs to be not necessarily gender neutral training, there are gender differences and we, mm. we acknowledge many gender differences. <coughs> but the training has to acknowledge the experience that many men do have. Mm. We can't quantify the proportion of domestic abuse that takes place that affects men. It can be anything between around 20% that actually come to the attention of the police to 50% that some researchers would, would come up with. It's somewhere in between there. Mm. We also need to stress that coercive control does affect men as well. <clears throat> there is some, some, the initial research when, when the, the um, terminology coercive control and also intimate terrorism that's similar. When they were first introduced, um, the, the authors insisted that these were predominantly what men did to women. But there's been quite a lot of research since then that illustrates that actually it happens a lot to men as well, by men, by other men and more so by other mm. women as well. It, it's, it's very, very common indeed. And that needs to be recognised. It's not... It, it's being called gendered abuse because I presume that's because it's between partners. Mm. It's possibly because it's more... It affects women more than men. Yeah. But it still affects a huge number of men and their children who are in the homes where this abuse is going on that we really need to take it more seriously. Now, men who are affected and men we, we talk with um, often say now that the police are quite aware of what's going on. They, they understand. I think they were the first group of professionals to really get it. Social workers, doctors, um, they all know it happens. They all recognise it. But it, just as it happened, I, I had an email yesterday from a, a, a man who suffered many years of coercive control at the hands of his wife, and he, he, he actually raised a problem that he, he found that illustrated the need for training for judges and sheriffs, because, as he puts it, wh when you're suffering coercive abuse, he said the acceptable becomes not only accepted, but expected. It becomes normalized, and that, that was mentioned earlier. 
And so that when he's talking about it, he's always minimizing it and trying to excuse it. And when it came, he had two cases of you know, criminal assault that came to court. And he found it very difficult to be critical of what his wife had done. He kept thinking, well, I was married to her once. She's the mother of my children. He was so used to minimizing it anyway and explaining away the injuries or the awkward situations that, that were cropping up. And the problem was that in, in both court um, appearances, there was a not proven verdict because he didn't seem affected enough. And it, that seems to be a gendered problem that, on average, a lot of men don't actually show the emotion, they don't show the hurt, the damage that's been done. Sometimes they show anger, and that doesn't work in their favour at all if they do that. But if they don't show anything at all, they just try and stick to the facts. It works against them because all, all, all that happened was just dismissed. So, so he was very much in favour of training, and, and I really think the training has to be what we would say gender inclusive rather mm. than gender neutral, so that we can talk about issues that particularly affect men and issues that particularly affect women, and hopefully, and, and people who don't identify as, as either or whatever. But we, we need to make sure everybody's addressed. I mean, even if it was 1%, it's important, but mm. it's a lot more than that. And are men more likely, or do you have any um, information, are men more likely to wait longer to report abuse? I believe they do, yes. They, they do seem to take much longer. and Sometimes that's attributed to masculinity. It's a feeling of pride, mm -hmm. and men sometimes believe they should be strong. They might feel that to admit that they're being mm -hmm. abused by somebody who others might consider to be weaker than they are, makes them less of a man that, you know, this mm. position is put across quite often. But the other, the other real issue for men is that they, they find it hard to find support. I mean, our charity is tiny and we, we do sometimes realise that it's not well, well enough known and we're still working on that. But we couldn't cope with all the cases, even if we were better known. Mm. So there's the lack of services. In the past, there was an issue of going to a service and being laughed at and not treated seriously. And the other thing is just the public narrative about domestic abuse mm. always says it's about violence against women and girls by men. In, in the previous session, I don't think abuse of men was ever mentioned. Fair enough, it was women's organisations. But I think sometimes that narrative that we just heard is the only one people hear out there. So a man who's beginning to realise that what's happening to him isn't right and he's feeling awful, and he, he, he can't recognise it as domestic abuse because that's something that happens to women. It's a women's issue. Uh, mm. so, so we maybe need to find a way of Yes, maintaining the importance of violence against women, but raising awareness that actually there's violence against men out there as well. And, mm. and it's equally important for each individual man. It's the same amount, on average, um, of suffering. Yeah. That's been very helpful. Thank you. Can I just amplify that? Because our... We, we, the charity carried out an, a, a, a UK-wide prevalence study about abuse within older people 10 years ago. And in Scotland, the prevalence of people in, uh, living in their own homes was that there were more men than women who were subject to abuse, which was contrary to the trend across the rest of the UK. Well, that's 10 years ago and a very partial sort of study. But just to amplify Alison's point about how men also are sort of likely to be victims of domestic abuse, contrary to what the sort of the, the national sort of uh, profile would suggest. Yeah, could I, I just add to that? Uh, I would absolutely echo those comments that it is, uh, as an organisation, we are gender inclusive, uh, I think was the right phrase um, mm. across. We support around 13% of our referrals are from men. Uh, I think there is, when we talk to, to men, about there is a, a particular stigma and a reluctance to come forward. Uh, 
um, because it's not the, not seen as the right thing to do from a man. Somehow, it's 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 more difficult, and men do struggle to come forward and admit they've been they're being harmed and hurt, uh, either by a male or a female in a in a relationship, and that has gone on for a period of time. Um, so very much, uh, there is an awareness raising that needs to be done um, to encourage people, and and I think there is an opportunity through the bill to encourage all victims of abuse, domestic abuse, domestic violence, to come forward and ask for help. Asking for help, asking for support is the right thing to do. We as a national organisation are right across Scotland um, and we would work with partners um, to, to encourage people and support individuals to have the courage to come forward. And hopefully through the bill, there will be the confidence that victims have to say enough is enough and I, I want some help with that. Th there were some questions earlier in discussions around training, and I think absolutely training for the authorities, whether it be the police and the, and the prosecution service, uh, they recognise they want to t tackle this issue. Um, and we very much welcome the opportunity to work with our partners in encouraging people to come forward, have the strength to come forward, and let justice be done. Uh, one more comment about the need for training. Would that be okay? Just, just something that, that the person who emailed me yesterday threw in, and I was really quite shocked by it. He said that he was informed by somebody who was present that in the lawyer's room in the sheriff's court before the case against my wife was heard, there were a number of ribald remarks about a man being a victim of female violence and casting doubts on my masculinity. If people are coming across that, I mean, that is not encouraging men to come forward. And that's, if that attitude's prevalent in the legal profession, we've got a big problem. So, yeah. No, I'm fine, thank Brief you. supplementary, Rona. Yeah, it's just, just to say on what Mary was saying and what, what's just been said, um, I, I think this bill will raise awareness for all victims of domestic abuse and will possibly encourage men to think, well, what's happening to me isn't right, and, and give them a voice. And, and you know, for, for, for all, and just really going what Alan and, and Kevin were saying. So um, would you agree with that, that this bill is a good thing to raise awareness generally? Yes, I think it might be. When I, I first heard about the possibility of a bill, a, bill for, uh, a law about coercive control, I actually thought it might work in men's favour, actually, because they tend not, well, they, they often do suffer from major serious assaults, but very often it is just a, a low-level, constant um, attack, I suppose, um, that they don't recognise as abuse. But if this is publicised yes. and the, the sort of behaviour that this is about is publicised, I think and hope more men will recognise it. Mm -hmm. And more women and other men will um, recognise that it's maybe a sort of behaviour some people do, but don't actually realise they're doing it. It's, I don't know if that's possible, but it would certainly be a sharp reminder to people that to be okay. careful of, of their own behaviour. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Oliver, followed by Ben. Oh, are you Oliver, you've been? My question has been answered. Okay, well, thank you. Ben. Thank you, convener. Just uh, very quickly, uh, Ronnie Barnes, I thought you, you spoke very purposefully about the uh, broadening of the, the, the bill's scope. And I just wondered, um, in terms of the, the, the definition of uh, the, the, the sort of abuse you're trying to capture, uh, how would, as well as partner and ex-partner, what, what, if you were to redraft the definition yourself, what would you, what would you put in there? Well, I suppose we would go with the, the, the definition that we have uh, within uh, our uh, own sort of charity, which is a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action occurring within any relationship where there is an ex expectation of trust which causes harm or distress to an older person. And that's very broad, but I mean, within that, mm. anything that strays into sort of criminality in terms of abuse, uh, violence psychological abuse, financial abuse. I mean, it wouldn't be hard to sort of work up the things that particularly we know go on on a kind of daily basis. And also, there's also to do with neglect. That's another feature of abuse that's probably a bit more insidious. And that's something that may well happen, say, in care homes about standards. 
and it's again trying to find a line in the threshold where something that becomes a poor standard becomes a criminal act and becomes uh, willful. Hmm. It's trying to find the willfulness as opposed to the sort of the, if you like, b more benign but accumulative effect of kind of poor standards of care. So it's, it's a complicated area. Mm. We're not, I'm not in any way suggesting this is easy to try and find even a form of words or find a sort of a, a clause within your bill that's going to answer what I'm looking for. But if we don't do it in this bill, we've got to do it somewhere else because this is coming down the track to all of us. And until we address this and get people to take it seriously, this is still going to go on. It's interesting Can that I other countries have taken on uh, this issue about abuse of older people and have made it an aggravated offence. We had at our conference last year um, the, the prosecutor from San Diego who talked very eloquently and passionately about having had this law enforced for the last 20 years and the benefits it's brought to his community. For, for, for clarity, um, th 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 that was more an expansion on the, the concept of abuse and that, that, that was, uh, I'm gr grateful for that, but uh, what I was interested in is um, in terms of the uh, the perpetrator how would you seek to articulate that so would that be an expansion to family members or to well yes because i think you see the uh, ambiguity that i'm uh, kind of i think with there here. are unscrupulous people out there not necessarily family members but people who get close to uh, victims who are able to exploit them and it's finding a means by which we send a signal that is unacceptable the thing is because we've got both, if you like, a regulated workforce who look after all the people, but because people are able to look at and buy in their own care, they've now got this unregulated workforce who people can sort of bring in. And there's no way of knowing how unscrupulous those people can be, and they can target victims. Because let's face it, people in, in, their, in their latter years are going to become more vulnerable. And that's before we talk about the issue to do with dementia and people's capacity to understand what's happening to them. Now, as I say, this is not easy, but I still think we can look elsewhere and see what other, people, what other uh, nations have done to try and address this problem. Because if we don't, the problem is just not going to go away. And I think the opportunity through this bill, and we're, uh, we're gratified that you know, this, this bill is actually going to uh, uh, happen, but I think this is an opportunity for us to at least have our concerns addressed as well in relation to older people. And I know it's not going to be easy for you to do that. And, and, and just very briefly, convener, just another question. Anne McCloskey, Anne Lynn McCloskey uh, you mentioned um, a, a set of figures around the percentage of, of male victims of, of abuse uh, that were, were in, uh, quantified within a, a survey that you did. Could you just clarify what the, the percentage was for uh, female victims of abuse within that? 87% uh, for, for females that come forward that in our community service. Uh, so it's 13% of men that come forward and 87% uh, is, is female. Great. Thank you. Okay, food. Uh, yeah, thanks, convener, and thanks, panel, uh, for uh, the evidence. Um, at the last um, session, just before you came on, there was quite a lot of talk about the non-harassment uh, orders um, that can be implemented by the court. I, w I wanted to know what you uh, thought about, specifically in relation to elders, and also men, what uh, the abuser in those particular circumstances getting a non-harassment order, if there'd be any um, complications to those situations. And I, I say that by you know thinking about maybe um, an older person may or may not have, um, the person who's been the abuser may have quite significant caring role that may not be able to be picked up uh, elsewhere or, or through the community services. And actually I had, um, in talking about um, a, a male victim of domestic violence actually he was aware of a situation some time ago where um, a male had been a victim. He, the female actually got a non-harassment order, which is quite <coughs> strange in itself because they're not actually used a lot, but then the female got one. And it actually led to extreme difficulties in the family, leading to um, the children um, actually needing other intervention um, because their needs were there enough, therefore not being met. So I suppose what I'm asking is, I'm giving a couple of examples here, is have you thought about how the non-harassment order aspect impacts your specific client groups? <laughs> I, I don't have statistics to hand on, on how many of the men we work with 
have tried to get on uh, harassment orders because I'm a trustee and the service manager who should have been here is, is ill. So I'm not quite sure if how many of our clients have, have actually tried. I just, I know it is, it's something that's not usually suggested to men and very few would try and few would, would get one. Um, on the other hand, well, no, no, it's not a non-harassment order. I mean, I was just going to see if there's any legal obstacle to men being with their families, which can often happen but in other moment, circumstances. But, but at the moment, it's, it, it's sort of more the Procurator Fiscal would... Um, I'm, I'm finding it hard it, to sorry, hear you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> the Procurator Fiscal at the moment would, um, would apply for it, but uh, if there was a change through the legislation, that there was more a presumption that um, if somebody mm -hmm. had committed and been convicted of that offence, uh, that there would be a non-harassment order put in place. I'm thinking about what the um, possible uh, impact could be um, if, if, it's di if it's different from uh, that that would be likely to be experienced by a male having a non-harassment order, um, which we talked more fully about in the last session. Sorry, I'm, I'm still not hearing, but... I'll let you say something because I'm not uh, quite sure. If we look at older people, I think one of the uh, successes of, that uh, has been in the last 10 years has been the adult support and protection legislation, which allows for the more complicated issues to do with you know, carers becoming perpetrators and the familiar situations about, you know, I don't want to have my son leave the house, but I want the abuse to stop. And I think there are means by which that legislation can uh, invoke sort of short-term measures like banning orders or removal orders, which can in fact bring about some change. We're not trying through this to try and criminalise everything and to interfere, as was said earlier in the early session, about family life, because that's probably going to be one of the main criticisms this bill's going to have, how much of the state is interfering in family life and how much of what happens is actually just what happens in families. But it's all about finding that line where you actually are straying into what is criminal behaviour. There are ways in which there are still means by which through, as I say, adult support and protection legislation in Scotland that can address some of these more complicated family situations. But it's when they go beyond that and go into... We have to be very clear about what is criminal behaviour and what isn't. And I think there are means by which we can do that through this bill. Yes, I would agree with that. I think there would be many men who would not necessarily want the abusive partner taken away or not allowed to um, make contact. It would be, I think it should be decided on individual cases. It shouldn't be automatic, but the, the possibility should be there for it to be relatively straightforward to put in place if it's needed. Me to maybe illustrate uh, the chronology of one of our service users in terms of her court journey. It'll take me a couple of minutes to talk it through, but it's in relation to non-harassment order. It culminates in a non-harassment order, which I believe um, would have happened sooner. And I'll, I'm tying a number of things to the bill as I go. It'll just take me two minutes just just to read it no, through. No, um, no question of anyone being identified. Oh, so, absolutely you know, not. Um, absolutely just not. Very generally, actually, as briefly as you can. For the please. purposes of anonymity, um, I've changed all the, the detail. It's the essence of it, and the timeline won't be exact either. Uh, it's noteworthy that there was a psychological and coercive element in this case, and that the threats had been repeated. We'll call the individual Maggie. Uh, her then partner pled not guilty to three charges, disorderly conduct, sending menacing statements uh, and a common law breach of the peace. Now, he was granted bail despite the Procurator Fiscal, fiscal opposing bail. This case met Section 1 relating to a course of behaviour. The conditions in Section 1, Subsection 2, that the reasonable person would suffer psychological harm, and Section 2, Subsection A, that the abuse of behaviour included threats and intimidation. So it's, it, it's not, uh, we're not entirely sure what Sheriff would have done had he been in receipt of a Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, but it's clear that he would have had, it would have been less discretionary. The um, now ex-partner was making life difficult. He was released on bail. The threats continued. And at this point, the procurator advised 
the police to consider whether there would be evidence to support a charge involving a controversial contravention of section 39 subsection 1 of the criminal justice and license in scotland act which the committee will be well aware refers to stalking um, in the interim the per per perpetrator called again to court uh, the civil court and whilst the petition did call in court no further order was made and the accused was released again now the accused was then arrested for send, sending sexually explicit texts and as outlined in section 4 subsection 2 of the current bill um, in his attempts to make contacts with contact with the child of the partner he's used that child to direct behavior at the partner this wasn't taken into account during this process and if you bear with me it is important i'm going to get to the relevant the relevant point here um, Finally, the case called again six months down the line after the initial hearing, so we're six months since the very first threat, the very first set of intimidating behaviour occurred. And so the law failed our service user. At that point, the sheriff sentenced the person to a community payback order, a fine and a three-year non-harassment order. So my point is, which will summarise quickly, that could have been achieved three or four months earlier if our client didn't have to go between the civil and the criminal courts. And that process meant she was victimised over and over again and traumatised as a result. And as a victim rights group, that's what we want to do is, is support and signpost as best we can, and a unifying law would have enabled us to do that. Mm -hmm. And just finally, by the way, rec recklessness um, is important, just in, as something just to pick up on what you said earlier on about the responses of men. Uh, that's, that's actually in the bill, that, uh, that, that the concept of recklessness, which means the focus will be on the perpetrator, whether the victim's a man or a woman, so even if a man is, is being a bit stoic and taking a bit longer. We cut yep. through this. Is your Apologies. point really that the, the wrong harassment order could a have been um, issued at the very beginning? Absolutely. The stalking was and, proved, and, and the threatening that, communication yes, through the text was proved, but there was no automatic wrong. Yes, and yeah. the overarching coercive thing. and psychological element that wasn't considered yeah. either. Which might have been an aggravating factor. And the aggravating case. factor in relation yeah. to the child. Okay, thank you. Recklessness. Yes, just for clarity. Yeah. Okay, Fulton, happy, yes. and Liam. It's just a, a brief question in relation to um, the wider scope of um, similar legislation south of the border. Um, we've heard um, evidence from previous panels that to an extent it's too early to tell what the, the impact of that is. In the first panel this morning, we, we heard suggestions that um, the cases brought under that leg legislation have been more limited, um, albeit I think that was in the context of the thresholds um, for abuse. Uh, but it would seem that the legislation in, in the rest of the UK does broaden out the, the, uh, to include some of the, uh, the, the situations that Mr Barnes and, and Ms Wall, you've been uh, alluding to. Have you got any impressions of how that legislation is, is operating um, to date? I don't. Um, I'm hoping that, it's, that the researchers are not going to show that somehow it weakens the impact of the bill. Mm -hmm. I think that was something that was maybe being suggested in the earlier session, that that may well be the case. Mm -hmm. But I can't really see how including people who have got significant uh, responsibilities and roles with all the people can be seen to weaken the bill because if they are included it makes that clear that they are included and it, yeah. and it, and I, th I mean I think to, I think to be fair to, to Dr Scott she was she was making that point in relation to the, the threshold, threshold of yes, harm yes, indeed. Um, rather than the, the breadth of those in, 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 in that case it may suggest that the actual widening out of the uh, definition of who could be the abuser may not in fact weaken the bill and if that is the case then maybe that is evident if you can gather evidence to suggest that that is helpful in terms of bringing in the kind of people that I'm talking about who need to be included in this, then maybe that's something that might encourage yourselves to widen the definition for this bill. Is that, is, do Victim Support Scotland have a, have a view or do you fall into the camp of it being a little early given that the, the implementation was only from the very end of 2015? I think at the moment it's too early to call on that one. Okay. Uh, during the course of our um, 
evidence we've heard from individuals and organisations who are, are either mothers or representing mothers and, and fathers about um, child contact being used by an ex-partner to abuse or undermine the other parent. I wonder if um, you have any views on that and what might be done to address it. Alison. Yes, I was hoping to mention that <coughs> certainly for fathers who have been abused when they leave the abusive home, as they usually do, and become non-resident fathers, that an awful lot of abuse continues while they're in that situation. Um, in fact, it's, it, I think, overwhelmingly men who suffer from this, although I know women do as well. But issues of contact, you know, the difficulty of it, even achieving contact in the first place can be very costly. It, it can mean visits to the courts. Mm. Men have, fathers have to prove that they're good fathers. They might have been the main carer up until the, the separation. But even then, if, if the child stays with its mother, um, in some cases, unless, unless there's an amicable agreement about contact, men often find themselves in a situation of having to prove the good fathers proving that they're even safe for the child to be with, even though the child's been in their sole company for lots of time up until the separation. So that's a problem, and, and contact can be turned off and on, what apparently at a whim. Um, it, arrangements can be changed, court orders can be breached, and in most cases the men are totally helpless if that happens. And if they... If they show annoyance that they've turned up to um, take the children and for some reason they're not having them and they get angry, then they're at risk of having the police come because they've maybe shouted or sounded aggressive when they're actually just extremely upset. And that can lead to all sorts of difficulties. So I know that is a major issue and I know that people who support fathers and these situations feel very strongly that this should be included as one of the behaviours that constitute coercive control. Because th this sort of behaviour, it, it actually abuses the child too. It's depriving a child from the benefit of a loving parent. Obviously, in cases where one parent or the other is a is really dangerous and can be shown to be, that's a different situation. I'm talking about people who are not, not at all dangerous, but, but acrimonious rather than dangerous. So that, that is a major problem. And it even extends to schools being told by one parent not to allow the other parent any information about the child when there's no legal reason why that should be the case. It, it, it's just constant controlling, making life difficult for the other person. And it can be very, very upsetting for the person who's affected and for the child. And, and the child needs to be considered. You know, it's, it, it really is a form of child abuse. Sometimes child contact is denied because more money is, is being asked for, more, more child support. And even the organisations that deal with child support, it was the CSA and now it's the CMS. I certainly was involved years ago in a case where a father was, well, uh, claims were made by the mother that the father had resources which he, he didn't have. It took 18 months for that to come to a tribunal where it was agreed that he wasn't owe any owed any money. He wasn't owing any money. And during all that time, the stress, the threat of sheriff officers coming around to, to extract this money that he didn't have, it was appalling abuse. So it's, it's, it's actually using another organisation to exert coercive control over a partner that you, you, know, you no longer have a good relationship with. And it's, it's really very, very serious indeed. And I know, I know for a while some men were committing suicide as a result of... CSA action. I, don't, I haven't actually been involved in a case recently. I don't know if it's quite as bad now, but it's certainly something we need to bear in mind. And the other thing is false accusations of abuse for a purpose, you know, if, especially in separation battles. It's, it's an easy way 
to not have to see your former partner that you don't really want to see again for good enough reasons. But again, it's, there's no legal reason to separate the child from that parent it, other than you don't want to see him, but your child is a different person and it's his, his or her parent. Um, employers are often approached as well. We've come across a few cases where <clears throat> somebody's maybe been a policeman or a teacher and an accusation of abuse or violence would seriously compromise their employment prospects and you'd be likely to lose their jobs. And in some cases, there were repeated inquiries to check out the, the truth of these accusations and the men were found to be faultless. But it, the stress and the waste of time and, you know, on everybody's part, is, it's really difficult. So I'd like to think that making use of other organisations or other people like brothers and fathers to harass an ex as well should come under the umbrella of coercive control. And victim support, I don't know if you have any views on that particularly. Maybe just a general point about the impact of, on, of domestic abuse and violence on, on, on a child and, and what they have to witness and experience uh, cannot be underestimated. Um, and for some children, unfortunately, that is the norm that they live with. And as a society, we want to avoid a situation where a child witnessing that believes that's acceptable and then moves on to potentially offending behaviour. We, we do a lot of support to children who appear as witnesses, vulnerable witnesses, in the court setting. Um, and some of the children are under eight years old, under 12 years old, and under 18 in different categories. And having to support the children to, for them to recount and recap what they have witnessed for that child is incredibly difficult. Um, and th there's, there's further work to be done, I think, to, to understand uh, what support can be put in place generally for children in the situations where they're caught up in, in, a, in a domestic violent family that's growing up when the perpetrator is causing harm, whether it be to the male or the female. Um, to, to, to actually support the, uh, to support the child through that uh, and help them. Okay. I think that concludes our, our questioning. Thank you all very much. And um, can I perhaps assure Mr Barnes that he has well and truly raised an issue which um, I think we're all aware needs much more attention. So please be assured at the very least of, of that today. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. I now suspend, um, no, let me see. Oh, yeah. We now move into private session. The next committee meeting will be on Tuesday, 20th of June, when we will continue our evidence taking on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill and consider our forward work programme and suspend briefly now to allow the witnesses to leave and the public gallery to clear. <laughs>